when you're in the hole. I'm sorry, but you gotta learn to respect the rules. No fucking boys. On April 24th, 2020, Brad Michael Elmore's vampire horror film Bit was released online after making the festival rounds a year earlier in 2019. The film follows Nicole Means as Laurel, a trans girl who undergoes a second major transformation when she is bitten by and indoctrinated into a group of feminist vampires. She must then decide if she has what it takes to be a killer as a larger evil lies in waiting under her feet. It's fairly low-budget indie, and you would be forgiven if you hadn't really heard of the film until now. But it is very monumental in both film and horror history, as at the time of release, it was the only feature-length horror film to feature an explicitly transgender protagonist. So for me, this fascination with trans horror really picked up around the same time the bit was released. Uh, you know, it was the first six months of quarantine, I had nothing to do, and I just so happened to watch a lot of the right movies at the right time. And I've always been into queer horror, I've always been into seeking things out that represent me and my community within my favorite subgenres. And what struck me about what at the time was just the trans killer trope, but has now expanded into the trans representation in horror as a whole, is this lack of firm, agreed-upon foundation. If you Google the subject, that brings up a few good think pieces, many of which I used as a launching point for my own research. But there's also a lot of unrelated stuff and news articles and... Fuck, why are we still talking about her? But what writings there are, are limited. Most of them stay within a 30 to 40 year span, starting around 1980 and never really going past 2013. And that's fine. Obviously, I'm not trying to like lay blame on other writers for not also being historians. But that is to say that up until this point, there just hasn't really been an established timeline or research done into specifically transsexual bodies in the horror genre. That being said, there is a pretty stable core of four or five films that come to mind when you say the term trans horror. But branching out outside of that main core is uncharted territory. When people write about trans horror, it's usually in the negative. It's usually about Psycho or Silence of the Lambs. It's lamenting about how poor our representation has been in the genre up until this point, and it's established, for lack of a better term. And again, there's nothing wrong with these hot takes or essays in essence, but I've seen a thousand of them. And there's almost no focus on the good stuff. Like, there's no focus on many of these recent films, because frankly, we're all too busy still doing a circle jerk over whether or not Silence of the Lambs is really transphobic or not. So what started as a personal project through mainstream films very quickly turned into this pseudo-preservation project. Since I started in May of 2020, I have gathered over 120 films, and it feels like every day I am finding new ones, because I severely underestimated just how unkempt this subgenre is, and oftentimes finding out about these films was just as, if not more difficult, than tracking them down and actually watching them. Like, long story short, on top of this being a preservation project, it's also a patience project. Because even if a film's description explicitly mentioned transsexuality in some way, I still had to track the film down and watch it myself just to be sure. There are a lot of films that people wrongly ascribe the trans horror label to, and that was where the real work came in, just separating genuine representation from the echo chamber of online film circles where people have just been repeating the same 20 films to each other for decades now and people just haven't done the research and haven't fact-checked each other on what is or isn't transgender representation. I was not prepared for how much effort this was going to take when I started this and I was not prepared for it to become my new thing, but everybody's gotta have a hobby, I guess. So I did have the rest of this opening recorded, but for whatever reason, my microphone audio did not save. So I guess we're getting the technical difficulties out of the way now, and let's just keep going from here. So the subtitle I put on the script is our history, our present situation, and what our future holds, and I guess you can take that as my thesis. This is a preservation project, and this is an examination of a subgenre what started it, what encouraged filmmakers to keep feeding into it, and how it has evolved, and why it has evolved in the way that it has. Why has trans horror remained so niche and forgotten when gay and lesbian horror is so much more meticulously cataloged and celebrated? And what is still to come? Even if the details of the depictions have changed, has Hollywood actually gotten any better about its transphobia problem? Has horror gotten better, for that matter? So, two disclaimers before we get into this. One, if you are not interested in a bananas-long video essay, but you are still curious about this topic, 
There will be links to my original written works in the description below. I am in the very, very, very early stages of creating a more permanent home for this information. Uh, so smooth segue, follow me on Twitter for updates on that as it comes along. But for now, the letterbox list in the description is the most comprehensive central hub that I currently have publicly available. And two, I can only be so visually graphic here on YouTube, but I do want to give a broad trigger warning for what we're going to be talking about here. Obviously transphobia, as well as homophobia, rape and sexual assault, genital mutilation, physical abuse, heavily implied and explicit child abuse, incest, etc, etc. If you do decide to watch any of the films off this list, please apply appropriate caution. I will also have the description annotated with the various timestamps in case that there are any films you want to just skip over. Related to that, spoiler warning for all of the movies. Many of these characters do come from third act plot twists and reveals, so viewer discretion is advised. So before I get comments wondering why I didn't include certain films, how are we defining horror? And perhaps more importantly, how are we defining trans horror? Everybody has their own unique definitions for this, but I think of movie genres as sort of like squares and rectangles. All horror films are thrillers to varying extents, but not all thrillers are horror films. I try to be consistent in what I define as horror, but your own mileage may vary. As for what constitutes trans horror, I try to avoid including films that only transgress gender boundaries in one scene. Gender transgression had to be an active part of a character's identity, and not just something that they engage with one time to escape one scenario. Uh, I also attempted to avoid films where the gender nonconforming character in question is a drag king or queen, for a myriad of reasons, but mostly just because I'm trying to keep the focus here as narrow as possible, although we will eventually discuss why terminology is so tricky in curating a list of this kind. And I questioned whether or not to include films that just so happened to include a trans actor, whether or not the character they portrayed was also trans, and for the most part I didn't, but I feel like that is the one area where I wasn't terribly consistent. It depended on the film, really. Usually my rule was that if the character wasn't part of the central cast, then they had to at least be in more than one scene. Same reason I cut films where it is subtext that wasn't intended by the creators. Like, I see ginger snaps come up a lot on other people's trans horror lists, and I also see that film as a really good trans allegory, but it would feel disingenuous to include it as intentional representation alongside many of these other films. Basically, it just wouldn't feel fair to include films that only some people view as subtextually trans alongside the films with genuine intent to represent. I didn't include Macumba Sexual because, I mean, Ajita Wilson's questionable post-death outing as maybe being a trans woman is just not something that I want to lump together with everything else I'm talking about here. Uh, same reason that Snowtown isn't included, I'm not interested in true crime films where the characters are modeled off of real-world victims. Very simply, we are looking at representation that is either explicit in the intentional casting or explicit in depiction or intent, and we are sticking to the fictionalized horror film. For my own sake, I have also divided this up into three subgroups. First, we'll be talking about everything up until 1980, then from 1980 to 2013, and then we'll finish off with everything from 2014 up until the present day. Now, I know that there is probably one film that we're all thinking of before anything else. But, wait, we're gonna get there. Very quickly, actually, but we don't start there. Hitchcock's 13th feature and third sound film, Murder was his first of several brushes with the cross-dressing slash trans killer trope. Released in 1930, the plot concerns one John Minor, as he attempts to exonerate Diana, a young actress accused of and convicted of the titular act. It's a bit too early in both Hitchcock's filmography and in the history of cinema to be more than anything halfway decent. You can see a lot of his later artistry and style forming, but it's not what I would call an essential watch if you're a Hitchcock stan. The real killer of the film is a man named Handel Fain, portrayed by Esme Percy. Fane's motivation primarily stems from the fact that he is mixed, half black specifically, a fact which the murdered actress knew and was going to expose prior to her death. Because, you know, the UK, where the only thing scarier than a trans woman is the mixing of the races. Fane disguises himself as a woman and kills her, intentionally framing Diana in the process. Fane is singled out to be the killer specifically because of his enjoyment of cross-dressing. He's apparently very good at imitating a woman's voice, which allowed him to pass as a woman when undertaking the murder. 
Even when he moves between different theatrical troops, he continues to take roles that see him donning feminine attire. Ultimately, Fane opts to hang himself rather than go to jail for the crime, although he was nice enough to leave a written confession that exonerates Diana before he does. Now, in an ideal world, we would have a few more films in this giant 30-year gap from 1930 to 1960. We might have at least one more film from one other director, but we don't. <laughs> because those are the decades of the Hayes Code, and alluding to queerness, including transness, was not impossible, but it was certainly more difficult than it was by the time 1960 came around and the Hayes Code was falling out of influence. So without further delay... <laughs> Look, if you don't know the plot of Psycho, you should not be watching this video. Very briefly though, Marion Crane steals some money to go marry her boyfriend. She changes her mind about that, but uh oh, shower kill. Her boyfriend and sister try to figure out where the hell she went while Anthony Perkins is being an angel, we did not deserve him. Psycho was known as Hitchcock's work above all else, but it was a novel originally, and that was inspired by the story of Ed Gein. The association between Gein and gender variance was due to the allegations that Gein was using the bodies of his female victims to create a woman's skin suit, and to long-standing rumors that Gein was therefore a transsexual. The influence of Ed Gein over horror is almost as looming and pervasive as Norman himself, which is interesting considering that there is really no evidence that Gein was gender variant in any way. So there's a lot of inspired by Gein films that do not depict transgressions of binary gender, and there's a lot of inspired by Gein films that ended up becoming some of the tent poles of trans horror, like Sounds of the Lambs and like Psycho. But let's just talk about the explicit text of the film. Norman Bates is not transgender. To the tune of directly spelling it out to his audience, Hitchcock tells us as much through Fred Richman. Why was he dressed like that? He's a transvestite. Uh, not exactly. A man who dresses in women's clothing in order to achieve a sexual change or satisfaction is a transvestite. But in Norman's case... He was simply doing everything possible to keep alive the illusion of his mother being alive. So, with the film throwing up this giant neon sign that says no transsexuals here, why is Psycho still considered one of the pillars of trans cinema and trans horror? This is a problem we're going to see a lot in this main canon, is this fear of the T-word. By and large, these films are just terrified to call their antagonists transsexuals, they refuse to use the actual term. They don't want to come outright and say, this group here is our monster, be afraid of this group. So instead, they use a bunch of other less definitive, kind of gray area terminology. Oh God, she's a boy. Ain't no lady here. You're a freak. A goddamn ugly brown Marcel! <laughs> this is mostly just suspicion on my part, but I feel like the reason for this is because... To define a character as transgender is to be very definitive. It assumes this level of autonomy that most of these characters simply do not have. This will be revealed more as we go through the list, but a majority of these characters are defined more through abuse and mental illness than they are any willing transsexualism, for lack of a better term. Gender nonconformity and cross-dressing are always symptoms of things like mental illness and abuse. They are not their own separate things. I think a lot of filmmakers try to work around this by simply saying that they aren't trying to represent trans people or the trans community in their works. Their character isn't trans, they're just so mentally ill that they believe themselves to be the other gender. We don't hate trans people, we hate men in dresses. We hate people who use gender deception to kill innocent cis boys and girls. We aren't being transphobic, we're just using all the dog whistles that signal that we are. Billy is not a real transsexual, but he thinks he is, he tries to be. It is easier to claim a character as gender nonconforming than transgender because a lot of people don't know and aren't interested in learning terminology. Ask most people. They couldn't give you accurate definitions of a transsexual, non-binary, drag, cross-dressing, and gender nonconforming. And they couldn't tell you why all of those things are different from one another. Some of that is age, some of that's ignorance, and some of it's both. Some of that is just the evolution of the English language. Non-binary is not a new identity, but it is very new terminology. And so when all of these terms in the public consciousness blur together to mean essentially the same thing, then you've got some leeway as a creator. You can write a character as a transsexual caricature, but if you avoid certain terms or phrases, you've got an emergency backdoor out of criticisms should you need it. According to his movie, Norman Bates is not transgender. He is mentally unraveled to the point of believing he is his mother, and thus cross-dresses to affirm this belief. And that's fine, I don't think that Hitchcock or the author of the original novel ever intended to genuinely represent transsexuality. 
and yet in large part because of audience ignorance about what transsexuality is versus what cross-dressing is, people still walk away from the film like, okay, cool, we're gonna just ignore everything that doctor said at the end, Norman is trans. Which, hey, I think Norman Bates is transgender too, but because I am deliberately and choosing to reinterpret the text of the film, not because I am believing that is what the text of the film itself says. Although Hitchcock certainly didn't intend it, looking for trans text in the film is not hard to do. Norman is deeply repressed, held back by his memory of a domineering mother who controlled every aspect of his life. He does not conform to male or female gender roles, which leaves him in a gray zone that feels almost ahead of its time. He cannot fully live as a man, but he is aware that he cannot fully be the monstrous woman either. As Psycho's later sequels will go on to explore, Norman Bates is less of a mindless killer and more of a tragic figure. He wants to live a normal life, but he cannot escape the abuse and societal misunderstandings in his past. In part because people outright refuse to see any humanity in him, Norman continually returns to his monstrous woman in order to exact revenge. It is impossible to overstate the impact that Psycho had not only on horror as a whole, obviously, but specifically on the transgender horror subgenre. In specific regards to trans horror, you can find Psycho's fingerprints over almost every single film on this list. Whether they portray a cross-dressing killer, an abuse of a domineering mother, split or multiple personalities, or even just copying a few basic shots that Psycho helped make famous, you can trace a line right back to Psycho from almost every single one of these films. The first of Psycho's less successful children would be released only one year later in 1961. William Castle's homicidal is... endearingly contrived? Let me try to communicate this in the most linear fashion possible. There are two half-siblings, Miriam and Warren. Warren is dating a woman named Emily, who we see murder a doctor in the opening scene so we know that she's up to no good. 75 minutes later, it's revealed that, in fact, Warren and Emily are the same person. Warren was actually female at birth, but was raised as a boy because daddy was a bit of a misogynist. After the father kicks the bucket before the start of the film, Warren aims to kill everybody who knew his quote-unquote real gender, and he creates Emily in order to live as a woman away from those who know him. This movie was rushed into production only two months after Psycho State's had release, and as a result, it's hard to view the movie as its own entity. It's even got its own doctor to explain the twist of the audience at the end. Like, okay, Hitchcock knew the doctor because the producers he was working with didn't trust that the audience would understand the twist. And they didn't, even with the doctor, so why in the world would you keep that in your movie? Anyway. 1967 brings us some hammer horror. Frankenstein created woman. Starring Peter Cushing, this is one of the only films where we sort of have to stretch the definition of what a trans character is. In this version of the story, Frankenstein, portrayed by Cushing, has an assistant Hans. Hans is dating a girl named Christina, who is ugly because they put her in the makeup chair for an hour. Christina's daddy owns an inn, which is frequented by three of the gayest men I have ever seen in my goddamn life. Eventually, the three stooges here kill Christina's dad and frame Hans, who then gets his head chopped off. Frankenstein does what Frankensteins do and puts Hans's soul into Christina's body. Murder and chaos ensue. I'll admit I'm not that well versed in my Frankenstein mythos, but I'm not sure if a literal soul has been referenced in these stories before or since. Usually, these stories are very concerned with the physical body and body parts, which, on their own, usually lend themselves very well to a transgender interpretation. But this is the first one I'm aware of that puts the soul of a man into the body of a woman. So by the end, it's accidentally a film about being literally trapped inside a body and a gender you don't belong in. In 1969, Britain returns to give us night after night after night, a slasher with equal influence from Psycho and Italian Giallo. Girls are getting slashed to pieces by a mysterious killer, we get a far less impractical shower scene, and then our killer is revealed to be Judge Lomax, a man noted for his harsh sentences for minor crimes. This is technically one of those a guy wears a wig for one scene films, but I count it within the canon because it is heavily implied that this is a thing that Lomax has either done before or would have done before. His desire to be a woman is tangled up in his sexuality and his homicidal urges, and all three eventually feel the other to the point of total insanity. We stay with Britain for 1970's Goodbye Gemini, but this one exists in much better quality and further is just a better film than something like Night After Night After Night. The story is focused on fraternal twins, Jackie and Julian, who get wrapped up with a predatory hustler and swinging late 60s London. The film is described as pretty incestuous, although it's more one-sided than that vague descriptor would lead you to believe. Julian is the only one who attempts to initiate any physicality, which is the only thing that Jackie outright fights back against, so it's not quite like Sleepwalkers or the People Under the Stairs. Even though Julian is really intent on eventually fucking his sister, he's also pretty gay-coded in the scenes without her. His relationship with Clive, the aforementioned hustler, is pretty touchy, and a few other characters comment that he seems just as likely a bed partner for Clive as Jackie does. Of course, that's before he helps in raping Julian and using that as blackmail against him. Myra and Audra are the two trans characters who do the actual raping. 
I have seen them described as drag queens, but I don't think that 1970s Britain knew or cared about the difference between the two. Either way, it is predatory gender nonconformity. Be afraid of the phallic woman. Add on that most of the male antagonists are markedly effeminate in some way, and it's an all-around anti-homosexuality horror film slash cautionary tale. Also released in 1970 is Beyond the Valley of the Dolls, an in-name sequel to a film I have never seen, but, um, <laughs> it's... What the hell was that? Okay, we're like seven films away from Rocky Horror Picture Show, but there is nothing I want more in this life than to set up a double feature between these two films. Frankenfurter and Zeman Bartel are the most endearing transsexuals to come out of the 1970s, bar none. Okay, so the movie is a satire of exploitation films of the mid-20th century, following this girl rock group that goes to Hollywood. Z-Man is this guy who throws a lot of parties and talks like he's in a Shakespeare play throughout the entire movie, and at the end he whips out his tits before he goes on a drug-fueled killing spree, which ends with him getting shot and dying too, and that's like, only the ninth weirdest thing that happens in that scene. <laughs> Writer Roger Ebert said that Z-Man being a transsexual wasn't thought up until the last second, which, yeah, I can buy that. His breasts are not a very convincing prosthetic, and you could have done the whole predatory gay thing without making him have tits. I compare him to Frankenfurter because they're both characters who are like, high camp and intentionally ridiculous, while also still somewhat playing into the whole predatory transsexual trope. And again, we'll get to Rocky Horror, but I feel like Beyond the Valley of the Dolls gets away with this by being a satire. Nothing in this film is a serious portrayal of anything, and that's what makes it fun. Z-Man is an awesome last second villain. And yes, this is the earliest on-screen depiction of a trans male character that I have been able to find, not just in horror, but in cinema as a whole. The next year, in 1971, there is Dr. Jackal and Sister Hyde, a twist on the classic story where Jackal decides that because women traditionally live longer than men, estrogen must be the key to eternal life. One mad scientist montage later, and Jackal's alter ego is revealed as Martine Beswick, who plays a sex-changed Hyde. Jackal is only able to turn into Hyde with the consumption of female hormones, and yeah, this is a trans panic story. The monstrous woman is going around killing young girls to sustain herself, and a few men for their trouble too. They don't use any of the language that might cue you into it, they sidestep transness by making the physical transformation between sexes a totally biological change, but it's still a story about a man who takes estrogen and transforms into a monstrous, murderous woman. That same year, Dario Argento releases Four Flies on Grey Velvet. I don't know if it's just me or not, but Giallo seemed to exist as both boringly simple and confusingly complex at the same time. So, in Four Flies, this guy Roberto stabs and kills this guy who's stalking him. Someone takes a picture of the exact moment and blackmails him, even though it turns out that the stabbed guy didn't actually die. But then he does die. And a bunch of other people too. Turns out the killer is Roberto's wife, Nina, who was severely abused by her father as a child because she was born a girl. He dressed and raised her as a boy, before ultimately throwing her into an asylum and then dying himself. Nina's still a bit mad that she didn't get to kill her father herself, and she reveals that she only remarried Roberto because he reminded her of her dad, which, yeah, I get it, this guy's a total cock. I'm personally pro-murdering this guy, but he's our protagonist, so we aren't that lucky. In 1972, Paul Bartel and MGM released Private Parts, a horror thriller about a young girl named Cheryl as she moves into her aunt's hotel and acquaints herself with the various colorful residents. Among them is a photographer, George, and if you're paying very close attention, you will catch that he has got testosterone bottles on his shelf. One or two reviews say that the priest is transgender. He's not, he's just gay. No, George is our trans character for the film, who further turns out to be Cheryl's cousin. I don't know why his mom raised him as a boy. There's no real trauma to either of them, and Aunt Martha isn't like crazy enough that forcibly transing her child makes any sort of sense. That distinction is actually going to go to another Aunt Martha later on this list. This is one of the few good ones, though, I would say. Beyond the Valley of the Dolls is the only earlier example, but this is still one of the earliest instances of a transsexual male in the horror genre and in cinema as a whole. And I'm not going to do this for all of them, but I really wanted to read the back of the DVD <laughs> because every sentence is a miracle. Check out who's checked in at the musty old King Edward Hotel in a seedy section of LA. Cheryl, a runaway teen who hopes to piece her life together. Little does she know that someone at the hotel has a nasty little pension for chopping people into pieces. Welcome, happy campers, to one of the screen's most bizarre works of camp filmmaking. Paul Bartel directs, guiding this loopy foray with, with the fervor of a carny barker at a freak show. Murder, fetishism, fetishism, fetish, fetish, fetishism, a dotty aunt, a sham clergyman, corny cops, a peeping Tom, and a guy who's a girl who goes night and night with a blow-up doll that has a photo of Cheryl's face taped to it. They're among the feverish parts of private parts. If you're without reservations, drop by the hotel. Like, I'm sorry, how do you not want to watch that now? 1972's I'm the Labyrinth is our second geology to this point. 
about a woman who goes looking for her boyfriend at an artist retreat after having a dream that he's murdered in some kind of M.C. Escher painting. Eventually, characters start revealing information about what his last days there were like, including when he went spying on Corrine, and discover that she's a trans woman. Corrine is played by a male actor but dubbed over by an actress, and it's actually the first depiction of a trans character who isn't evil or seriously fucked up in some way. She's part of the antagonist group, yes, but she's mostly there just to hang out, and nobody really makes a big deal of it. For 1973, we have A Reflection of Fear, which stars the then 27-year-old Sandra Loke as 15-year-old Marguerite, a girl who lives in relative isolation with her mother and grandmother. She spends a lot of her time either painting or talking to Aaron, one of her dolls that's pretty apparent it's supposed to be a divergent personality of her own. She also takes daily shots of what she believes to be insulin, although the bottles don't have any labels, and you can kind of see where this is going. And those shots you take every day? I have diabetes. If you're so smart... Why do they take the labels off the bottles? Her dad, played by Robert Shaw, shows up one day to reconnect with her, and things get incestuous very fast. Then some people start dying around the island, and that culminates in Marguerite becoming Aaron and attempting to kill her father. The film ends with a phone call that Shaw's character had made when Marguerite was delivered at the hospital, which finally confirms to the audience that she had been born male. Our records do not show the birth of a girl. I don't know if the implication is supposed to be that he forgot his daughter was trans, or if he was trying to fuck her because she was trans, and I don't know if the movie ever outright states why Marguerite isn't aware of her own transness, but whether or not it's stated outright, it's psycho. It's an implied abusive mother, and her child becomes murderous as the result of a split personality, a girl and a boy. Miss Leslie's Dolls was actually considered lost up until very recently, a low-budget black magic film that feels like if Tourist Trap had also included evil transsexuals and a predatory lesbian. The titular Miss Leslie is played by Salvador Ugart, although he's dubbed over by someone else to make it a teeny bit less obvious when they do the surprise, it's a man in a dress reveal. A man! Damn. You're a Damn. man! <laughs> Leslie is obsessed with putting her soul into the body of a younger woman, which she eventually accomplishes by way of the predatory lesbian, Alma. So now you've got two bad tropes, the prize of one. And in 1974, the Spanish horror film I Hate My Body premieres at Cannes. The tagline reads, the brain of a man, the body of a woman, the sexual horror story of our lifetime, which is awesome, but unfortunately this movie is mostly a domestic drama about how much sexism sucks. The opening is where we get all of the fun body horror sort of stuff, where a man named Ernesto has his brain placed into the body of a woman named Lita, after they were both left near dead. There's one or two moments of near lesbianism that comes as a result of this body-brain disconnect, and there's a very small subplot about Ernesto's car accident actually being the result of his wife wanting him dead, but that doesn't really go anywhere. Most of the movie is Ernesto being frustrated that he can't get work as a woman, even though he's uber qualified, and then he gets assaulted and murdered by a pack of dudes because, dang it, being a woman just sucks. Okay, I was really torn on whether or not to include this, but I figured I was mostly just going to get people yelling at me if I didn't. So, Rocky Horror Picture Show. <laughs> <laughs> I do not want to get into the discourse about whether or not Tim Curry's Frankenfurter is transphobic or not. I cannot stress this enough. I do not care. I don't even think this counts as a horror film. It's a comedy musical with brief horror elements, but this is technically what could be considered a main canon film, so it should at least be mentioned. Sweet Transvestite is a bop, and how you view Frankenfurter will mostly depend on if you want to be pessimistic or not. I've seen reviews that love him. I've seen reviews that rightly point out that he's yet another example of a predatory trans character. Both can be true at the same time. For me, though, I don't view the character nor the film as intentionally offensive or targeted or even really cruel. Even the writer of the original stage production has stated that he didn't mean for transsexualism to be as prominent in the story as it ended up being. It just sort of wound up that way. So, no, it's not a PC depiction by the standards of any decade, but it's fun, damn it, and I'm in the business of having fun, especially on this list. I see you shiver with anticipation. Queerness is the quote-unquote antagonist, yes, if the film can be said to have one, but by the end it's not the villain, and there is a difference. And I guess I'll mention it here, I haven't watched the Kenny Ortega TV movie remake from 2016, but I figure if any actress has the screen presence and charisma to pull off Frankenfurter, it is Laverne Cox. Patient. One year later, in 1976, we have Larry Cohen's God Told Me To, a sci-fi cop procedural about a series of murders in New York City, where the motives are always that God told them to commit their crimes. In the plot, Officer Peter Nicholas investigates all of these murders, ultimately discovering that the entity behind them is a man named Bernard Phillips, played by Richard Lynch. Early on, it is established that Phillips is born of indeterminate gender, 
although the doctor assigned him male at birth and claimed that no problems ever arose of this. It's not until the end of the film that reveals that both Phillips and Nicholas were born of alien fathers, with the former being more extraterrestrial and the latter being more human. Phillips offers a particularly graphic rib vagina to Nicholas, which is thus reviewed, and then Phillips kills himself because, naturally. The Tenant is a horror film also released that same year. It's funny, films usually start with the director's card, but this one just had this swirling endless portal to hell. Weird. Anyway, if I have to say anything positive at all, is that the endless portal of hell is capable of directing some genuinely tense and stressful atmospheres, and this results in good scenes, but not necessarily a good movie. The Portal to Hell also stars as Tchaikovsky, a man who moves into an apartment and then gets force-femmed by the whole complex. There's a bit of build-up to this idea of lost identity, but for the most part it's just like, one scene he's fine, and then suddenly he wakes up wearing makeup and is fully dedicated to becoming Simone, the previous owner of the apartment. It's representation by proxy, gender transgressions representing the ultimate indicator of insanity. I think that if there's one thing that we can glean from this era of films, it is specifically the impact of Psycho on the genre. Aside from a few outliers, most of these films follow a very cookie-cutter way of forming their antagonists. It is almost always this lack of autonomy, where the character has little to no say over their own identity expression, more often than not the result of an abusive mother or guardian. Sometimes these characters are explicitly trans, but it is far more common to see representation by proxy. They don't come outright and say it, so this is the era probably with the most debatable films on the list, but the intent and implications I think are still there. And with the exceptions of Beyond the Valley of the Dolls, Private Parts, and Four Flies, it is almost always a man being forced or generally emasculated, put into the position of being a woman. And this will lay the groundwork for the decades to come. So the 80s for me are defined by one moment in particular. But besides that, the 80s and by extension the 90s are filled with some of these subgenres most defining moments. The tropes previously established in the 70s and 60s continue to persist and evolve, and this is where we're going to get some of the most well-known examples. Not only the most well-known, but the most offensive and perhaps the most relevant to understanding how we got to where we are today. In 1980, fresh off of the success of Halloween, the Jamie Lee Curtis vehicle Terror Train is released. Jamie Lee plays one of several medical students being stalked at a party on a train, where David Copperfield is the main attraction, because the 80s, I guess. Anyway, we started the film by bearing witness to one of those horror movie pranks that would have gotten everybody arrested for assault, at the very least. The victim of this prank is a kid named Kenny, who conveniently vanishes after the start of the film, so you can pretty safely assume that he's the one who starts killing his former bullies. One film later, and it turns out that David Copperfield's presence actually was important to the plot, at least a little bit. It turns out that Kenny had been Copperfield's female assistant, and one must assume that he had been in that disguise for a while, considering that he had to have been with Copperfield long enough to not only be hired, but also to learn the tricks and routines necessary to successfully pull this off. So yes, this film's a bit on the edge of what I would consider trans horror, but I think the implications of Kenny's disguise makes it more than the stated text does. That same year, we have Brian De Palma's Dress to Kill, a film that is very open about its inspirations and homages to Psycho. This is another one of the core canon films where even if people don't know the plot, they usually know the twist. Much like Psycho, we spend the first portion of the film following a sexually frustrated blonde woman before she is abruptly murdered. The rest of the film is a whodunit sort of mystery, as the murdered woman's son and Nancy Allen attempt to figure out who the killer is. Also present in the main cast is Michael Caine, and... Oh... Uh, oh uh, no... <laughs> Okay, so we're going to talk about this a bit in length, actually, because unlike the psycho bedrock, Dressed to Kill is explicitly about a murderous trans woman. Dr. Elliot's quote-unquote alter ego Bobby goes after a woman that he finds sexually attractive, and this is perhaps one of the most famous examples of a dangerous trans woman going after and murdering cis women. On paper, it's a very, yikes, all problematic depiction. And in execution, it's still not great, but there is some attempt at empathy. Most notably, the scene where Nancy Allen's Liz attempts to explain transsexuality to Peter, which is obviously not PC. You see, there's some men and women, too, who think they're born in the wrong body. They're called transsexuals, and all they want to do is have their sex changed. But, I don't know, it has the same effect as someone trying to explain trans people to a grandparent. Of course, it's not perfect, but it makes an effort, which is more than you can say for a lot of these films. This is not just updated or ripped off Psycho, it's De Palma following through on the idea of a Norman Bates type as a trans woman. It's looking at the ending of Psycho and wondering, what if Norman was transgender? How would that change the plot? 
And like many of these films, it's not outright condemnation of trans people, it just so happens to be another transsexual killer film, which does paint that incorrect picture that our audiences walk away with. Brian De Palma hasn't talked a whole lot about this film. Uh, the most recent interview that I could find was from 2016, where he admits he doesn't know what trans people think of the film, and that the psychopathic trans killer trope is detrimental to viewing us as human beings. So, no, I'm not on the transphobic De Palma bandwagon, but at the same time, out of our main canon, this is the film where I understand hanging it the most. It's the one where transsexuality is the most important to the plot, and as a result of this, it is also the one that has the worst implications and the worst overt transphobia. In 1981, Wes Craven's fifth feature, Deadly Blessing, is released. And although this is not an apt description of the plot itself, the transgender twist is like a gender swap private parts, to the point where I'm genuinely curious as to whether or not Craven saw this film before making this. This film, though, is about Martha, recently widowed and subject to harassment by a neighboring religious community. Her other neighbors, a mother and daughter pair named Louisa and Faith, are incredibly kind by contrast, and so of course they are revealed to be the ones actually doing the slashing. Faith is also revealed to be a trans woman, perhaps forced into this by her mother, previously heard spouting off about her hatred of men and her love of her daughter. Well, I hope it's a girl. Boys ain't nothing but trouble. Well, I guess my old man made me hate the whole breed. <laughs> I swear, if Faith had been a boy, I think I'd have just stuck her in the river like a sack of kittens. In 1982, Unhinge may be best known for its place on the infamous list of video nasties. Filmed in Portland, Oregon, and location scouted by future director Gus Van Sant, Unhinged follows three girls who, after a car crash, are taken in by a mother and daughter, and who are subsequently picked off by an unseen killer. The daughter's name is Marion, and there is a male character by the name of Norman Barnes, so yeah, this is another film with Psycho just reeking off of it. Marion is yet another trans woman forced to transition by a man-hating mother and thus driven to murderous insanity, where young cis girls are her primary target. Also in 1982, the Hong Kong slasher He Lives by Night is released. This is another one of those movies where, were it not for the obscure media subreddit, I probably would have had to leave this off the list because I could not track it down otherwise. So thank you to this Reddit user, whose name that I cannot pronounce, for contacting me and uploading this film with English subtitles. You saved my life on this one. The plot follows Sissy, a late-night radio DJ, as she reports on a series of murders around town, the victims all being connected by the fact that they are wearing white fishnet stockings. It's an interesting film, taking on a sort of vignette style, where Sissy and her two cop friends are what connects everything together, while large chunks of time are dedicated to setting up and executing the killer's next victims, all of whom are entirely new to the story up until the end, where Sissy is targeted. The murder sequences are actually genuinely pretty upsetting, especially the one with Susie in the bathtub. Although, they don't gel at all with the film's comedic elements, which are far and away the biggest issue with the film itself. The killer is a character named Eddie Wong, who, like many characters in this film, doesn't really have a relationship with any of the main trio. He's just some crazy asshole, driven to insanity because of his wife's dedication to cheating. One day, he comes home to discover that who he thought was a female friend of his wife's was actually a man disguised in drag, wearing the white fishnet stockings we've seen be Wong's trigger throughout the film. And even though he snapped, he knows a good disguise when he sees one, and thus the drag outfit becomes his thing. The fact that he pees standing up is also what makes Sissy realize that they're dealing with a male killer and not a female one. Also, I'd be remiss if I didn't show the clips of the 7-Up machine, which is... bizarre. <laughs> Hong Kong Transsexuals, brought to you by 7-Up. In 1983, Paul Leader of <laughs> fame releases Vultures, a two-hour showcase of Jim Bailey doing different drag acts. There's some very loose plot about a family being picked off, as the patriarch seems ready to die and let go of his fortune at any moment, but the film is so achingly boring that it doesn't really matter. Jim Bailey plays Richard, who I think is the youngest child, but he also plays five other roles which are intended in the story to be Richard in different disguises. Up until the end, that is, where I think he snaps, and then fully assumes the female identity of Olivia Mann, because, you know, nothing but subtlety from the director of Ape. A A Blade in the Dark is next, a giallo film cobbled together out of four half-hour-long episodes that have been deemed too graphic to air on television. Which, yeah, this is an agonizingly boring film, as I think most giallos are, but there are one or two moments that are genuinely gory and spooky. Bruno is a composer, currently working on the score for a horror film, which the director had partially based on the life of a woman she knew. Turns out that woman is Tony, the guy who owns the property that Bruno was staying on, 
and who had been so traumatized by being called a female as a child that his masculinity regressed. His ego as a child was too fragile, which caused his masculinity to regress. But he couldn't kill his alter ego, so he projected his anger onto other girls, wishing to kill the girl in himself. It's one of the more bizarre ways of validating their transsexual killer twist, but hey, that's nearly all it's got going for it, so fine. American Nightmare is a Canadian effort at the Giallo style, one of the few earlier horror films where the trans character is a supporting role and not the primary antagonist. Dolly is a trans woman who lives next door to Isabel, a girl who was murdered in the opening scene and whose brother eventually comes looking for her. This was actually filmed in 1981 and not released until 1983, which makes sense considering its striking similarities to Dress to Kill, but it doesn't have any of the sex or the kills or the transgressive themes to be truly comparable. It's one of those movies that are like, oh, look how we treat people that we think are lesser than us. We're all humans. Which, fine, whatever, we're about to enter the Reagan era so we could actually use some of those. Dolly mostly dips in and out of the local strip club, sometimes helping our protagonist before she's abruptly murdered by the killer, and she's the only death where nobody realizes she's even dead, until our protagonist literally falls into her body. And then he's like, oh, damn, that sucks, and the film ends, and I guess we have to assume that Dolly is just still rotting at the bottom of a stairwell. Also released in 1983 is another main canon film, and another one that we are going to have to slow down and talk about for a minute. Every trans person I know has a different opinion on Robert Hiltzik's sleepaway camp, but for the most part, it is all surprisingly positive. I think what makes or breaks the film is how people interpret the twist, which is far and away the most famous aspect of this movie, and what makes it incredible that this has a full HD upload on YouTube. So while I haven't sat down and watched and read every piece of Sleepaway Camp media, I don't think that Hiltzik has ever said why he chose this twist and why he chose to reveal it in the way that he did. He doesn't give a lot of interviews, and the fan-run website for the series only has snippets of the original screenplay, and the ending is not among those, so we can do nothing but speculate here. That being said, I would venture to call the text of the film sympathetic, although that is not what most audience members walk away with. Audiences walk away remembering Girl Dick and how fucked up and scary that is, even though I don't think the text of the film itself supports seeing Angela as an outright monster. In writing about the film, my friend Isaac points out that we don't actually know how Angela feels about her own transness, only how everyone else does. It's everyone else who comments on her femininity, it's outside forces who deem her freakish or literally queer. You queer or something? And even though reading this deep was probably not intended, it does give Angela this sort of credibility. She's not a caricature, she is a real girl who is continually victimized for not performing femininity up to the standards of others. She is kind and sweet and reachable, but only when people can be bothered to treat her like a human being. She's very similar to Carrie, actually, wherein we have this villainous victim at the center of the film. Both girls are abused and beat down upon, leading the audience to want to sympathize with them. But both girls are also quote-unquote other in such a way that evokes fright, maybe even disgust in that same audience. They are victims, pushed to do bad things because they are unable to be accepted for who or what they are. They are not inherently monsters, they are made to be by the society around them. They are, I think, cautionary tales about what ignorance and intolerance does, both to the society at large and to the individual. But that's not what most people associate with the film. For better or for worse, that ending. Credit where it's due, it is still genuinely shocking to new audience members, nearly 40 years later, even those who correctly guessed the twist of Angela being the killer. But it's shocking to the point of completely overshadowing everything we just talked about about the film having genuine nuance up until this point. And that's a shame, because I think that knowing the gender twist and nothing else really puts people off from watching the film. Especially now, where people are like, hyper-conscious about the media they're consuming, I'm worried that people are either going to ignore this film outright, or go into it expecting to hate it and have that confirmation bias. I know several people who didn't watch the film up until very recently because of those fears of hating it, and they ended up actually loving it. My friends got this for me for Christmas, I think as a gag gift, but um, <laughs> I really do love it, and I'm super thankful that I have it because I do intend to eventually watch the director's commentary, and I don't think it's going to tell me anything that I don't already know or suspect, but still, I think it's awesome that I actually get to own this. It's one of those films where I've seen it a bunch and my opinion of it does change a little bit every single time. So I think that it's one of those films where you shouldn't just base your opinion off of the views of others. You should actually sit down and watch it for yourself. Obviously out of the main canon, Psycho is like the best film, but Sleepaway Camp is probably the film where I am most likely to casually rewatch it. So in 1984, our next film is titled either Fatal Games or Olympic Nightmare, depending on your location. 
This is a one of a kind film on this timeline because it's the only one that tackles the idea of a trans woman only existing to compete in female sports. Our killer is a nurse, Diane Payne, who has been targeting a bunch of students at the school specially designed to train athletes for the Olympics. Why she works at an Olympics-based school isn't explained and doesn't make much sense, considering that her drive to kill comes from the fact that her transness made her ineligible for the Olympics several years prior. You would think that she'd try and avoid sports, but hey, I didn't write this. Payne also keeps around newspaper clippings about her quote-unquote failed sex change so that our final girl can have the reveal spoon-fed to her as well as to the audience. This movie isn't very remarkable, but it does feel at least slightly poignant that it came out less than 10 years after Renee Richards sued the United States Tense Association for Discrimination. As for the Olympics, they did not come up with guidelines that allowed trans people to even qualify until 2003. And up until these most recent games of 2021, there is still a lot of vitriol reserved for transgender athletes, specifically trans women. Three years later, in 1987, we have Strip to Kill. This one is a loose collection of strip scenes and slashing strung together by a plot involving a female officer named Cody Sheenan, who has to go undercover at a strip club in order to flush out a killer who's been targeting the girls there. The killer is ultimately revealed to be Eric, the brother of one of the strippers, Roxanne, both played by Pia Kamaki. Early in the film, Eric kills her off screen over jealousy caused by Roxanne's relationship with another stripper. To keep from being caught, he dresses as Roxanne at night and works her job at the club, latex breasts and everything. Also in 1987 is the shot on video film The Newly Deads. The plot of this one kicks off with a resort owner murdering a trans woman, who subsequently haunts the resort and the huge and wacky cast of characters that end up there. There's some icky trans panic murdering in there, otherwise the fact that the ghost is a trans woman doesn't really matter. Hide and Go Shriek is a 1988 slasher set inside a furniture store, where the antagonist is more effeminate than he is transgender, but I think it still works for pushing transphobic rhetoric. There are lots of shots of lipstick contrasting with 5 o'clock shadows. The killer disguises himself as a woman in several scenes, much to the horror of the soon-to-be victims. Again, we have conflation of effeminate gay men with trans women, which are then both conflated with being fucked up and evil. Also in 1988 is Sleepaway Camp 2 Unhappy Campers. At this point, Robert Hiltzik had sold the rights off to other people, and you can tell pretty immediately that this is a completely different set of creatives. It's much more aligned with some of the later Friday the 13th sequels, much more focused on comedy than it is any sort of genuine horror. You can also tell that this is a different bunch of filmmakers because they are very eager to push Angela's transness under the rug. Sleepaway Camp technically has two and a half more sequels after this one, but two is the last one that I'm spending any sort of time on because it is the last time that Angela's transness is discussed at any sort of length. Her transness is wiped away with an opening camp story about her, establishing that she underwent under confirmation surgeries effectively making it so that they don't have to do any follow-up on surprise girl dick. Except this girl, she wasn't a girl. Evie, let's go. She was really a he. His aunt had been dressing him up like a girl ever since he was four years old. She's alive. It's a guy? Not anymore. He went into a psycho ward a couple years ago. And while he was there, the doctors gave him a sex change and our parents' taxes paid for it. Well, he or she or whatever got out a couple years ago. And then she spends the rest of the film being every other crazy slasher villain, completely devoid of what made her unique and interesting in the first place. And since this is the last time we're talking about Sleepaway Camp here, I'd like to mention that there is, or at least was, a reboot or a prequel in the works as recently as 2020. Felissa Rose has alluded to there being something planned for the film's 40th anniversary in 2023, and I do not have confidence. Because, okay, it's not that Sleepaway Camp isn't ripe for a reboot. That's part of the problem, is it really, really is. It is so primed for reckoning and reimagining. Because there's so much you can do with a transgender final girl, with a trans-focused summer camp. You can really draw these themes of isolation and performance out from the original subtext into explicit themes. And hell, you don't even have to trash the original timeline. You can do what Evil Dead did and make a reboot with new characters and new themes with a familiar story and environment. You can tell the story of a new Angela, who this time perhaps isn't forced into her transness, but still struggles with her own identity and community. Maybe she's still the killer, maybe she's the final girl this time, but you could and should play with those expectations from an audience who isn't expecting a trans final girl to succeed. And modern mainstream horror will never do that. If a reboot ever makes it out of development hell, I would be very shocked if transsexuality was included in any way, shape, or fashion. Or if they do include it, it's probably going to be either some backhanded comment from a side character or a statement of acknowledgement of existence, like the Black Christmas reboot did. Because uh, he went totally crazy on me when all I did was ask why his syllabus has no women on it, queer people on it, trans people on it, 
people of color on it. Yeah, but... And who knows, maybe in five years this clip will age horribly and a reboot will come out that will be everything I ever wanted it to be. I hope that that's the case. I hope that I am wrong about the hypothetical reboot that may or may not ever come out. But unless you hand this franchise over to trans filmmakers, I just don't think that there is anything more to the story of Angela that needs to be told. And our last film for 1988 is, um, a doozy. Curse of the Queer Wolf is, on paper, a satirical comedy that pokes fun at toxic masculinity. In execution, though, this is an agonizingly offensive punching down on trans and gay people for 90 minutes. Like, this was made in the middle of the AIDS crisis, and the plot is about a good heterosexual man having sex with a trans woman, who then passes transsexuality onto him like a sexually transmitted disease. The only funny gag in the movie is the group of torture-wielding priests, especially the moment where they're all crammed into a phone booth together. But even then, those are the same characters who are introduced by hunting down a trans person and murdering them. For a comedy, it's a shockingly cruel film, and I'm sorry, I don't buy into any of the cast and crew's insistence that it's actually a film about toxic masculinity or whatever. Yeah, there are some jokes in there about John Wayne and being quote-unquote man enough to beat transness, but if you were trying to be satirical, then you buried the lead too fucking deep. It's honestly pretty ignorant to make a movie on this concept at all, let alone in 1988 as gay and trans people were actively dying from AIDS and HIV. 1989's Sunny Boy is one hell of a weird mix of Raising Arizona and Texas Chainsaw, starring Brad Dorff, Paul Smith, who you might recognize as Blue Dorff from the live-action Popeye, and David Carradine as Pearl, his trans wife. The plot follows the trio as they raise a kidnapped baby together, but the film itself is mostly an exercise in unexplained insanity that manages to be captivating in spite of itself. Maybe made even weirder by the fact that nobody ever comments on the fact that Pearl is very obviously being played by David Carradine. I kind of appreciate the restraint, actually. And our last film of the 1980s is Alejandro... Alejandro... I'm not even gonna try. Santa Sangre. And it's... one of those movies. I don't mean that insultingly, but like, you know what I mean. The kind of movie where a main character gets aroused and a literal uncontrollable snake springs out of his pants. That kind of movie. First, there's our main character, Fenix, who I swear to god is this, like, awful mix of Dennis Christopher and whoever played the Duke in Moulin Rouge. He effectively speedruns the plot of Psycho by literally becoming his mother's hands and embodying her after her death. Then there's also The Saint, a female transgender wrestler that Fenix gets the hots for and eventually murders. And, credit where it's due, they never really make more than one or two jokes about that, aside from drawing to the fact that she's abnormally strong. There is also literally no available information on the actor or actress who plays this part, so I can't even say what their gender is, and I'm actually very not comfortable guessing that, so... Tentative thumbs up? I started filming at like 9 this morning, and it's like 3 in the afternoon, so this is just chocolate milk by now. The Silence of the Lambs is the last of the main canon as people know it. There are, of course, still many mainstream films to go, but this is the last one that most people instinctively think of when trying to recall horror films that include transsexuals. And much like Psycho, that is a descriptor that is flawed. Again, we're going to have to look at the text of the film versus what audiences took away versus what the subtext might indicate. Probably one of the most famous quotes about Buffalo Bill within the film is the one where Hannibal notes that he isn't a real transsexual. And as we've seen throughout this list, transsexuality and debilitating mental illness almost always go hand in hand. And usually it's mentally ill over transsexual, like the latter is a symptom of the former. There's no correlation in the literature between transsexualism and violence. Transsexuals are very passive. But a lot of people have raised the point of, well, what is a real transsexual? Consider for a moment the barriers that exist for a trans person just to get diagnosed, let alone those in place to prevent them from getting gender-affirming surgeries. Consider that the film never offers up an example of what a real transsexual is, it just sort of dissects their bodies, sometimes very literally. And look, Buffalo Bill is, as the kids say, problematic. Once again, regardless of what the text of the film says, audiences still walk away seeing an evil trans woman who is obsessed with murdering cis girls to make a woman suit. But because of that real transsexual aspect to the character, I do know people who relate to Buffalo Bill and find relatability in that total exclusion from community and society. He's problematic, but he's not without supporters. So this is an interesting film to be the last in pop culture canon, considering that transsexuals and certainly the trans killer trope did anything but disappear from this point. So is there any reason why Silence of the Lambs is the last one that people remember? I think a lot of it has to do with mainstream accessibility. Um, Silence of the Lambs was not only a major financially successful blockbuster, it won Oscars. It was a huge, inescapable film, much in the same way that Psycho was. 
And we just haven't had a major horror film since then that explicitly tackled transsexuality like that, even in passing. Again, most filmmakers want to avoid the T word. They don't want to get canceled. And so depictions of transness to this point are still very half and half. Remember, it's always mental illness over intentional transness. Very few of these characters transition as a result of their own free will. And so Buffalo Bill, ironically enough, marks perhaps the last real transsexual for mainstream audiences for the next 20 or so years. The T word is still very taboo to use, and you're not really going to find many more horror films okay with even verbally alluding to this in the way that Sounds of the Lambs does. This is a timeline of films and not television, but I do briefly want to mention the Clarice television show, which actually decided to directly tackle this particular aspect of the original. I can't vouch for the quality of the show, I haven't seen it and I'm not really interested in seeing it, nor can I vouch for how well they actually pulled this off, but from what I've read, it does seem like they did their level best. And they do actually have conversations about what it means to assign and conflate transness with mental instability and murderous tendencies. Buffalo Bill was clearly a, a monster, a, a, a killer, and I don't know what their story was, but they got labeled transsexual. And whether it's true or not, that word was then in every headline, every story, every gruesome tabloid photo right next to murderer, maniac, psycho skins women driven mad by transsexual desire. That was the front page of the Baltimore Herald. Overnight, suddenly the biggest story on everyone's minds was that transsexuals were monsters. Next, we welcome back Brian De Palma with Raising Cain. John Lithgow plays a child psychologist with a wide variety of personalities, all a bit crazy in various ways, and he steals the show in every single scene that he's in. The plot with his wife Jenny is totally fine, it's some classic De Palma unfaithful wife antics, but I would also be lying if I said I wasn't a bit bored of it, knowing that Lithgow was running around kidnapping kids just off screen and giving the performance of a lifetime. One of Lithgow's personalities is a woman named Margot, which gives us a few moments of him being a bit effeminate, but she's one of the lesser personalities, so it doesn't go as far as something like Psycho does, or even something like Split, which, no, that film's not on this list. There are a few minor nods to Psycho, but there's actually more in keeping with De Palma's own dress to kill than anything else. Both are films with famous actors portraying characters who don don wigs and trench coats, and both predominantly feature these characters inside elevators during pivotal scenes. But Raising Cain isn't a ripoff. It focuses more on multiple personalities than it does transsexuality, even though there is one little comment about a woman looking like a transsexual, because I just don't think De Palma could help himself. I hate this wig. My hair is gray. They couldn't find one. I looked like a transvestite. Ghost Watch is a British sort of found footage horror film, where the BBC made a fake news show that slowly revealed itself to be a ghost story as the segment went on. The ghost haunting this particular house is of course a trans woman who killed herself and was left to rot under her stairs for weeks because nobody came looking for her. I don't know what trans women did in Britain for them to be constantly on the receiving end of this kind of fucked up brutality, but we're not even halfway through this list and I am already exhausted by it. 1994's Color of Night is infamous for being a quote-unquote bad movie, but honestly it felt a lot like a lower tier De Palma from the plot to the cinematography, so no, I didn't hate this. Bruce Willis plays Bill Kappa, a doctor who visits California and starts a relationship with a woman named Rose as people around him start to mysteriously get killed off. Kappa takes over this therapy group of five from his murdered colleague, one of whom is this kid named Richie. I knew he was the trans character going in, and when I saw that he was obviously a female actress under heavy makeup, I just sort of sat back for the ride, so it took me nearly 70 minutes into the film to realize that in the world of the film, everyone thinks that Richie is a male who wants to be a woman, so that was a baffling realization. Richie has a gender identity problem. I'd like to be a, a woman. Have you seen a doctor? Yeah. So the next step is the Thank child. Thank you, Buck. But yeah, in the world of the plot, the real Richie is the dead brother of Rose and her other brother, Dale. After his death, Dale forced Rose into literally becoming Richie, and Rose did not emerge again until the arrival of Kappa, which implies that this is not only a transgender by force story, but one of multiple personalities as well. It's incredibly rare to see both of these elements in a film, when usually there's one over the other, but that's also to the film's detriment. There is zero focus on Rose as a victim, or even as a human being. She's a sexual object throughout the entire film until they suddenly get cold feet about making her the villain, and they drop incest and intense physical abuse onto the laps of an already uncomfortable 90s audience who just spent the last two hours getting horny over this poor abuse victim. So, weird, gross. Thank you for that. <laughs> and he, he made me dress in these clothes, 
and he did things to me that made me not want to be a woman anymore. I was with you from then on. Most franchises tend to get weird by the time they hit the fourth installment, and Texas Chainsaw The Next Generation is no exception to that rule. It's famously disliked by audiences and considered one of the worst sequels in the franchise, which is funny because I think this series is nothing but bad sequels, in my opinion. Leatherface is an interesting character because even in the first film, there is an intentional femininity to him. A Twitter friend sent me this quote from Gunnar Hansen, where he intentionally refers to the character with both he and she pronouns. And while I did not include the first three films on this list, I do think that Leatherface as a recurring character does represent this idea of abuse manifesting itself in transsexual practices, for lack of better terminology. Putting a man in makeup is still an easy shorthand for communicating that there is something wrong with him. And if that man in makeup is also wearing another man's face, then more to the point. In The Next Generation, Leatherface is sort of downgraded to the secondary antagonist role, making way for Matthew McConaughey for the primary villain. And this is the first time where his femininity is a major focused upon aspect of his character. He's worn makeup before, yes, but this is really the first time where he's wearing wigs and dresses and being treated by others and by himself as a woman. And this is also the first time where his femininity seems to impact his ability to be a villain. Now that he's running around in an evening gown, McConaughey has to fill the threatening male role. So for our next film, I want to flash this across the screen. This is technically not a horror movie, but it is a good movie, and so we're going to talk about it anyway. <laughs> my friend Nathan recommended this to me when I was writing my first piece, and it's really only available in one of two ways. Either you buy the DVD, where it is one of several featured films and art pieces, or you contact the director directly, Mindy Onodera. And I hope, I hope so hard that I am pronouncing that right. <laughs> I did the latter, and we had a lot of great conversations, and I'm very thankful for that, and I still want to be very, very careful about how I present this film, because I don't want people to see this sandwiched in between Texas Chainsaw 4 and the Psycho remake and think that this is just another C-grade slasher. So Skin Deep is focused on Alex, a filmmaker who becomes the item of obsession for Chris, an androgynous transgender man. I still don't want to go too deep into the plot because this film is so obscure and I really do want Mindy to get some recognition for this because this is the best film about transsexual males to come out of the 1990s. In this film, gender matters an intensive, great deal to certain characters and matters not at all to others. There seemed to be an intentional parallel in two back-to-back -back scenes where two different characters considered normality. I just want to be normal. <gasps> I never did find normal. But I found some kind of truth. And I think the film does a really good job of exploring that difference in ideology, that divide between queer people that still exist today. Between wanting to assimilate and be seen as normal versus acknowledging that our idea of normality can't really coexist with normality as seen by a cis hetero society, and so we have to find acceptance and comfort within our own communities. One could consider Chris the antagonist of the film, but only if you were looking at images without context. There is no human antagonist of the film. Perhaps intentionally, the only person ever harmed by Chris is Chris. He's a character inseparable from his gender, but not in a way that solely defines him, and that's not really a nuance we're going to see again until nearly 2020. He's not a threat to anybody but himself, but that doesn't stop everybody from assuming he's inherently dangerous anyway, which, like, okay, stellar commentary on the way that trans men are perceived even within many queer spaces today. So TLDR, this is another good movie, even if I do have to stretch my definition of horror a little bit. I don't have the DVD on my shelf here because I don't have like 300 disposable dollars to like spend on art right now, but I encourage that you do seek this film out if this kind of stuff interests you. Midi is a brilliant artist and filmmaker, and she deserves more recognition for this, and I hope she does get it. Now, jumping right back into the exploitation slog of the 90s. First for 1998 is the Psycho remake by Gus Van Sant. This is one of those remakes where it's mostly pretty negatively panned, but I have seen a few reviews and hot takes that saw it more positively than just a shot-for-shot -shot remake with no unique or interesting attributes of its own. And I do think that that's an interesting take, especially considering that this film does seem like an experiment. Like, Gus Van Sant knew that he wasn't going to be able to do his own thing with this story, and... Brian De Palma already kind of did that with Dress to Kill, and so he went in the other direction. That being said, there are a few weird little additions that I'm not entirely sure what the point of them are. Every time there's a murder scene, for example, some weird art film stuff flashes across the screen. Lila also gets a girl boss moment during the climax. <laughs> Let's go, girls. Which is set in a fruit cellar that looks far more like Buffalo Bills than it does Norman's. The sound design is also very overbearing throughout the course of the film. Like at the end, for example, when we're doing the Doctor's summation of events again, there's a whole lot of bubbling noises and the score comes back, and you can barely hear anybody's dialogue as a result. 
Most of the film up until the end uses the exact original script, but they completely nix the exchange about Norman possibly being a transvestite. So like, obviously this isn't on par with the original, but it's also a film that knows that. And if you go into it expecting a traditional remake, you're not going to get that either. Most of the movie just sort of washed over me where I wasn't really angry at it, but I wasn't loving it either. But then the ending happens, and that's where a majority of the significant changes are, and that I actually really enjoyed. And this might just be me reading into things too much, but the intentional overblown sound design did feel like commentary. Gus Van Sant seemed to know that even if he did a remake that changed some things from the original, audiences were only ever going to be able to see the original film and compare it to it. The images are all there, but you can barely hear what's being said over the psycho score being blared over and over again. So even if it's not a good film, I think it is an interesting experiment, and I think it should be examined as that because this isn't the brainless soul-sucking money grubbing remake that people seem to think it is. Surrender Dorothy doesn't really feel like a traditional horror film, but it's certainly a precursor of things to come. Director Kevin DeNovis stars as Len, a man who's turned into a woman by his friend Trevor because Trevor wants a girlfriend but finds the dating process a bit too difficult. We haven't talked about Victim or The Skin I Live In yet, but Surrender Dorothy feels like an early blueprint of that storyline. I think it's interesting that this film feels more concerned with power dynamics and relationship dynamics than it does with sexual power and emasculation. That's still a huge part of the story, of course, but it's less of a central focus than it is for something like The Skin I Live In. And I think that's why I enjoyed the film more than those other list examples, because the focus isn't squarely on how quote-unquote horrifying the process of gender transition is. It goes there in the last 10 minutes, but it's otherwise a lot less focused on transploitation than its sister films, and that's what makes it more interesting. It's a feature, but not a focal point. I actually do get the sense that the feminization was chosen as an avenue to tell a story, and not just to get edgelords and easily scandalized critics to buy a DVD. Next is another film with two titles, Rough Draft or Diary of a Serial Killer. I affectionately refer to this one as the transgender Gary Busey movie, even though he's not, technically. He's a journalist doing research for a piece by transvestites, and his whole thing is that he is super method about every story that he writes. So naturally, he's in full drag for the first 10 minutes of the film. And like, obviously it's a really bad movie, nothing about any character motivation or interaction makes any sort of sense. But Arnold Valsalo from The Mummy plays the serial killer that Busey has to face off against, and he's doing this homoerotic Hannibal meets Heat thing, and it's just the funniest performance I've ever seen in my whole life. And yes, eventually the transvestite story does come back into the plot, and we've got a trans woman, Erica, who ends up coming back from the opening as well, even though, yes, she ends up dead like five seconds later. So somehow Diary of a Serial Killer, despite conflating transvesticism with transsexualism, does still contain more explicit transness than a lot of other explicitly trans films on this list does. Go figure. Also, we do have a minor cameo appearance from Jasmine. And fun fact, that makes her the first black trans person to appear on this list. Grand total, we've only got about three or four black trans characters, and god, that's bleak, but we will talk about that more when we get to it. Wild Zero is a Japanese horror comedy starring the band Guitar Wolf as themselves, the coolest thing put to any film ever. It's a zombie alien horror, but okay, seriously, let's just focus on Guitar Wolf here for a second. They are still releasing albums to this day, by the way, with 13 total to their name. And in this movie, they are this trio of dudes who are pro-LGBT, anti-rape, semi-supernatural deities. They are awesome. Watch this movie for Guitar Wolf. It's also a pretty decent movie for its transpositivity, if my previous statements didn't appropriately allude to that. Ace is our main character, who is not part of Guitar Wolf, and his love interest is this girl named Tobio, who I believe is played by a male actor but dubbed over by a female one. There's a statement on the Wikipedia page that says that Tobio is played by a trans actress from Thailand, however it is unsighted and I could not find a second source that also put forward this information, so take from that what you will. And like, Ace's whole arc is that he freaks out when he finds out that Tobio is trans, but then Guitar Wolf comes in and they're like, hey, knock that shit off and then he spends the whole rest of the film trying to find her and confesses love to her. And this is probably the earliest horror film to give a trans character a love interest that doesn't start and stop at, oh, she's deceiving him. Like, you're actually really rooting for these two crazy kids to make it by the end. And they do. And yes, the initial reveal scene is gross, but the movie makes it very clear that Ace is in the wrong for his reaction, and the rest of the plot is dedicated to apologizing for it. Seriously, seek this one out. It is so fucking cute. Next, Neil Jordan, who is perhaps most famous for Interview with the Vampire and the trans-based crying game, ends his prolific 90s with In Dreams, a movie considerably worse than those two previous examples. Not for any story elements, it's just an irritatingly made film. You've seen it before. A woman is connected to a serial killer, and everyone thinks she's crazy, but she's the only one who can stop him. For this film, our killer is Robert Downey Jr., near the end of his drug issues, but not completely through them yet. 
He's fine, I guess. He's appropriately effeminate, and he dips back and forth between male and female at any given point. But this was also the film where I realized that Neil Jordan might just be a bad director. Like, everyone's acting is off. It's not right for the tone they're going for. It's just really self-serious and directionless for something that's as comedic as its script is, intentionally or otherwise. Anyway, considering that he made The Crying Game a film very famous for its surprise girl dick moment, I was surprised that this film didn't have anything similar. It's another serial killer who cross-dresses to signify their broken mental state, which was initially broken by an abusive mother, and you get a bit of extra transphobia by having it be a character obsessed with little girls and creating a family, because remember, trans women are evil and specifically focused on ruining innocent cis women. Beyond those elements, though, it's one of the more forgettable, connected-to-the-killer movies that I've seen, and note that I have seen Hideaway. Out of Japan, we've got Red Room, a film that barely clears the hour mark because there's not a whole lot of story outside of seeing people act to pray for money. The director for this is mostly known for porn, and you can kind of tell immediately just by how this whole thing looks. Hiromi is our trans character, because apparently 10 million yen equals one sex change, and so she is in it to win it. You get one goofy shadow shot of her penis, but otherwise her gender doesn't factor into the story much until the last five minutes, and only then to have sex with a woman who has just died, because why not? This one's on a lot of disturbing film lists, and I guess I can kind of see why, but I'm not really into that subgenre, and I felt like the Looney Tunes sound effects they put over everything kind of destroyed the atmosphere anyway. That same year, Troma Entertainment releases Terra Firmer, a horror comedy celebration of trauma films that is meant to take place during a fictional production of one of their movies. In the background of all the movie-making chaos, one of the cast members, Casey, is revealed to be a serial killer. Their mental state was shattered after being born intersex, and their father subsequently decided to castrate them and raise them as a girl. And look, it's a trauma film. It's hard to say that this feels particularly cruel or targeted when the film takes shots at every conceivable minority group. You watch trauma to laugh and groan and get nauseous. You don't watch them to consider the moral implications of the plot. But with that being said, the fact that Casey dies from having a pole shoved into their vagina and through their body does still feel uncomfortable. It's not as bad as some of the other comedies featured here, but it does still feel a bit like punching down. Besides Casey, there are also a few background extras that are listed as being transsexuals or transvestites, as well as Andy, a girl who starts out wearing a fake mustache and slowly becomes more feminine as the film progresses. I think she's actually meant to be a joke about lesbians rather than another transsexual gag, but I honestly can't be sure. Also, in the movie within the movie, the Toxic Avenger gets pregnant and is able to deliver a baby, so, you know, good for him. Now you finally know why I've been using transgender Toxie as my sensor bar throughout the video. This feels like one of the few comedies on this list where the intent to offend doesn't necessarily come from thinking that marginalized groups are inherently lesser. Like with Curse of the Queer Wolf, there is no balance in jokes. It is just a constant beating down on trans people and gay men, and that's your whole movie. And yeah, you do have to sit through some uncomfortable things with Terra Firmer, but I, there's such a wide variety of jokes that I don't think you can sit down and reasonably claim that trans people are targeted more than anyone else. You do have to watch Matt Stone and Trey Parker dance around like assholes as two hermaphrodites, but the message at the end manages to transcend that childishness somehow. <laughs> Let's work to make it a more tolerant tomorrow for all those people with both sets. Thank you. Our first film of the turn of the century is Cherry Falls, a post-scream slasher starring the late great Brittany Murphy. Here, the slasher formula is inverted by the killer targeting virgins. Murphy finds herself trying to solve the mystery of the killer's identity and finds out that it might be closer to home than she realizes. The slasher is Murphy's teacher, Leonard Marlison, who turns out to be the product of a brutal gang rape, one of the participants being Murphy's father. Leonard was subsequently horribly abused by his mother before he eventually decided to exact revenge for her as her. This is another semi-psycho-esque portrayal where transness is tied to necessity and mental illness, as well as the idea of a man becoming his mother, but hey, it counts. Kareem Malachi Sanchez also features in this film after last being seen as Chris in Skin Deep, and he's one of those neat little bits of connective tissue throughout this list alongside Mike Kellen, Brad and Fiona Dorif, Lloyd Kaufman, and Vince Vaughn because you're really not expecting to see actors come up multiple times on this list, and so I do think it is cool that we get to run across a few familiar faces every now and again. Maléfique is a French horror film from 2002, and Marcus is another example of people's inability or lack of desire to differentiate between trans characters and drag characters. In some reviews and descriptions, Marcus is referred to as a drag queen, and sometimes they're referred to as a transsexual. In the context of the film itself, it's never stated outright, but the character has, like, actual k-cup breasts so i'm going to call transsexual the proper descriptor this is one of the few times where it feels like the lack of specificity for marcus's identity is intentional though and not just the result of ignorance 
though the resident prison rapist, and that's the start and end of their whole characterization. Marcus is actually one of four convicts in a jail cell who find this Necronomicon sort of book, which results in black magic and low-budget shenanigans. Eventually, the group has to do the ceremony that unifies the two genders of creation, but then Marcus gets stabbed and killed because they weren't a real woman, and that's basically the end of that. For 2004, we have the fifth entry into the Child's Play series, Seed of Chucky. Now, some of you may be saying, Logan, why only Seed of Chucky? After all, isn't this whole series about a man trying to transfer bodies? Isn't that trans? And I would say, I am so proud of you guys. You have no idea. I have no notes. That's a great reading. But in terms of this list, I only have two Child's Play films here, and we're going to get to the second one later. Reason being, Chucky spends most of the series as a male trying to get into other male bodies. It's more of a solid gay metaphor than it is a trans one, although trans overtones do still exist in every single one of these films. I chose Seed for this list not for Chucky, but for his child, who is perhaps the most famous character from this film, and also the most underappreciated. We're going to be calling this character Glenn for the sake of consistency, because veering back and forth between Glenn and Glenda is just going to give me a headache. Glenn is the child we see very briefly at the end of Bride of Chucky, and by this film they have grown up and finally been able to track their parents down. Very early into the film we establish that Glenn has no genitalia, as they were born as a doll and thus has no human gender that can be reflected on their doll body. As a result, Chucky refers to Glenn as his son, while Tiffany refers to them as Glenda, her daughter. Glenn stays in male mode through most of the film, although they do eventually snap and become Glenda, wig and makeup and dress and all. And this is where we get most of the gender transgression stuff, where Glenn talks about a desire to be both male and female, or some combination thereof. Sometimes I feel like a boy. Sometimes I feel like a girl. <gasps> Can I be both? Well, some people... <coughs> No way! Some people see this as intersex representation, and others see non-binary. I'm more into the latter, but regardless of the terminology you use, Glenn is undeniably one of the earliest examples of transgender representation that isn't strictly binary, and that also isn't inherently joking and exploitative. Despite being a satire, it's surprisingly sincere, actually, considering the rest of the film. What am I? After this film, the series underwent a gentle sort of reboot and has been slowly bringing these sequels back into the canon storyline. But Glenn so far has been absent from all of that, which I think is a shame. I think that we should get Glenn back in some form or another, especially considering that it was such a struggle to get a film this overly queer made. And now Mancini is having much less trouble expressing those queer themes explicitly in the new show. And hey, we actually do get a reference to Glenn in the second episode. My Twitter feed is still making gender fluid jokes, so there may be hope yet. You have a kid. Gender fluid. What's that? Isn't it cute? My darling Glenda gave it to me. They have exquisite taste. <laughs> I do think it's really funny with that scene that everyone's like, wow, Chucky LGBT ally confirmed. And like, I'll talk about this more with our next Chucky film, but I just think it's super funny how he's like pretty explicitly transphobic in Seed, and then some events happen, and by the time the TV show comes around, he's like, Actually, I pride myself on being a queer-friendly slasher. I will clear homophobic bullies. Trans rights Chucky. Also in 2004 is something called Chainsaw Sally, a low-budget early 2000s horror movie that is exactly what you think it's going to be. The titular Sally watched her dad, Leatherface Gunner Hansen, get murdered by lunatics, so she herself grew up to become a serial killer. It's actually a really funny movie, both intentionally and not. Like, I don't know what it was because this isn't, like, a good film, but it's surprisingly competent, it's well-edited, and... Noted huge and horror guy Mike Flanagan was actually the DP. And then they introduce Ruby, Sally's sibling, and that just kind of killed all the momentum the film had going for it before that. Like, there's never any real transphobia in the text of the film, and I would classify Ruby as more effeminately gay were it not for so many descriptions of the film and reviews describing him as a transvestite, or a transsexual. I have doubt that a transgender portrayal was intended by the filmmakers, but hey, if we have learned anything, it is that most people don't care to know the difference between cross-dressing and transsexuality, so there's a lot of overlap that might not necessarily be accurate, but still constitutes a sort of representation on its own. In 2005, my home base here in Las Vegas is Trans American Killer, otherwise known as Switch Killer, according to some releases. I actually own this movie on DVD as well, because, like, I went to Zia Records, I want to say back in September, when I was still making my first list, and I saw this there. And I went back over a year later, and the DVD was still there, and so <laughs> I decided to buy it, because I'm just like... At least I know what I'm getting into. Switch Killer follows Jamie, a woman in Las Vegas who is being stalked by her abusive ex-boyfriend. Her ex-boyfriend, Bobby, believes that Jamie is a lesbian, so he undergoes a sex change and starts killing a bunch of people. Bobby's even got evil red eyes, just to make sure he didn't miss the whole evil predatory trans woman thing. 
Credit where it's due, this is definitely one of the earlier examples of the trope it perpetuates. We don't see a lot of films where a man transitions for the explicit tent of harm, not until around 2019 at least. There's a few where the intent is just sleeping with a heterosexual man, but I would describe those two intents as different. Bobby goes after cis women primarily, as expected, but also cis men who attempt to sleep with her without knowing about her gender status. That same year, Sion Sono's Strange Circus is released in Japan, and I know I gave that general content warning at the beginning of this, but I feel the need to flash this here too. Warning. All of the triggers. Um, if extensive sexual abuse is something that bothers you, I would recommend just skipping the, to the next film entirely. You have been warned. The first half hour of the film centers on Mitsuku, a 12-year-old being sexually abused by her father and eventually physically abused by her battered mother. This culminates in the death of her mother and Mitsuku attempting suicide, after which it's revealed that it's all the story of a novelist Taiko. Yuji is one of the men assigned to read the story as well as to investigate Taiko's past and... Oh god, that's a tragic haircut. Anyway, Yuji is notable for being the last explicitly trans male character in a feature horror film, and... I wish I had more to say about that. <laughs> I mean, it's fine, they have a surprising amount of restraint about it, really only alluding to and not showing for a significant amount of time. Then they do show his DIY top surgery and it's appropriately horrific. It's pretty rare to have the transsexual villain be a trans male, so that's notable. Obviously this is a film more concerned with fetishization and monetization of sexual trauma than it is with gender dynamics, as we find out that Yuji is Mitsuku and Taiko is the very much still alive mother. It's a film about what a person does to survive the aftermath of a traumatic event, how it alters the reality that you're able to live in. There's certainly an angle for a transphobic reading, I think. Yuji's actor is playing the femininity angle up a bit much, but it's such a minor focus that I don't find myself mad or offended by it. It's a good movie regardless. Id is Japanese artist Kei Fujiwara's last film to date. For whatever reason, I could not find subtitles that properly synced up to my copy of the film, and on top of that, it's already a very confusing film to try and follow. So I don't have much to say about the plot. For our focus, we have a trans girl who's going home with some sort of police officer. He finds out she's transgender, and well, you can guess what happens from there. Actually, he doesn't even brutalize her. A bunch of other characters do, including her father. Not the first film to use a trans character to indicate moral decay and depravity, but certainly one of the goopier ones. In 2006, Suki Bon Boy is released in Japan about a boy with a feminine face who is disguised as a woman and sent to a girl's school. And I mean... God, if some of my other Google searches for this timeline didn't get me put on a watch list before now. Like, there are some films that get pretty sexually graphic, but this was the first film that I had to watch on an actual porn site. And there weren't any subtitles on that copy, so I had to download them separately, and had to read along at my own pace, and so it was not the ideal viewing conditions. Either way, Sukiban Boy is based off of a manga from the 70s, and in execution it comes across as a parody of Japanese exploitation films like this. As a result, I have like five minutes of footage that I can show on YouTube without having to cover the screen in sensor bar toxies. It's not porn, but I can understand why I could only really find this on porn sites. Lots of nudity leans very heavily on the comedy, a part of horror comedy, but at a certain point it just turns into a gore film and that's pretty fun. I wouldn't describe anything in the film as terribly offensive, since it's only an hour long and they don't really do anything with Sukupan being a boy. It's mostly just an excuse to show the nipples of every other character. At the end, she's injected with what's supposed to be, like, fast-acting estrogen, and her love interest gets injected with super testosterone, so she becomes a boy? It's all very tongue-in-cheek, I didn't hate it, and it actually has kind of a cute ending. <laughs> For 2007, we visit Thailand for sick nurses. Nurse Taiwan is a trans woman, later revealed to have transitioned in order to sleep with the male doctor at her hospital. However, after her sister also starts sleeping with him and ends up pregnant, her sister and the other nurses opt to murder Taiwan, rather than deal with her going to the police about their barely hidden selling of cadavers. This is another weird movie because, yes, obviously it's transphobic in nature, but also because Taiwan's ghost is head-to-toe painted black? It's not intentionally blackface, I don't think, but it's still very uncomfortable. <laughs> that being said, once it gets going, the film is insanely beautiful, and I do get the impression that we are meant to be sympathetic towards Taiwan far more than we're supposed to be afraid of her or disgusted by her. That same year, also from Thailand, is Train of the Dead. I don't have a lot of familiarity with Thai horror, but I feel like the abysmal ratings this got means that it's not just me. As far as I can figure, the plot is a bunch of criminals get on a train, there's ghosts, antics ensue. It actually took me a bit to realize that Anke is supposed to be the trans woman. I thought she was just, like, eccentrically dressed. You know, like a pirate. Pirate robbers, I don't know. 
she's annoying, but not any more annoying than literally every other character. Then she dies, and I let my eyes sort of glaze over at that point. Admittedly, the subtitles felt like they'd been fed through a Google Translate blender, but I also don't think that I was missing anything of substance. So, very intentionally, I haven't sat down and ranked any of these movies. Um, Part of that is because that just isn't the point of this list. I'm just trying to create a cohesive timeline, not rank best to worst. That being said, Gutterballs is the worst movie on this list. I want to be clear here. I am going to get a little bit angry talking about this, but that is not meant as a personal attack on anybody involved in this film. By all accounts, Ryan Nicholson was an incredibly nice man, dedicated to indie horror. I have heard nothing but good things from people who knew him. He died two years ago at the age of 47 as a result of cancer, and that is too young and too soon. My complaints and anger aren't with him as a person, they're with his story and with his film, and those two things are separate. On paper, Gutterballs is a parody of 80s slashers. Taking place inside a bowling alley, we follow a series of revenge killings, which come after a girl is violently attacked and raped by a group of her peers. But in practice, this is one of the most mean-spirited, cruel, and ugly films that I have ever seen. Nicholson admitted outright that the spark that drove him to create this movie was the desire to, quote, give a man a vagina. And, well, for better or for worse, he did that. (laughs) After the rape scene, which lasts a full 10 real-time minutes, trans character Sam is subsequently murdered by our masked killer. The killer then mutilates her, creating a pseudo-vagina out of her genitalia, which we will see over and over as the film continues. In my original write-up of the film, I said that it was the only film on this journey that I did not finish. And that is still true. Um, You will notice that I didn't even download the film to use clips. This film made me feel gross and disgusting in a way that little else ever has, and this list was full of gross and disgusting movies. If you have any urge to commemorate a filmmaker gone too soon, this is not that film to do that with. This whole thing is a history project, but Gutterballs needs to die in darkness, forgotten where it belongs. Another Ryan Nicholson film, Hanger, was released in 2009, and that also features a trans character played by Lloyd Kaufman, and uh, forgive me, but it is the only film here that fit my criteria that I just straight up refused to watch. <laughs> uh, there's still just this bitter taste in my mouth from Gutterballs, and I I just couldn't do another one of his films. There's clearly an audience for this sort of grimy, intentionally offensive stuff, but I am just not a part of it. Slice is a 2009 Thai film about a disgraced former cop slash hitman's journey to stop a serial killer whom he believes to be his childhood best friend. The killer is also intentionally brutal to the genitals of each of their victims, usually cutting them off and shoving them into various orifices. Much of the film is our protagonist, Thai, flashing back to that childhood best friend, Nut, who was the subject of a lot of violent and homophobic bullying that Ty either did nothing to stop or actively participated in himself, as well as some trend true incest, as we've seen time and time again on this list, and random seizures that point to some undisclosed mental illness. Eventually, Ty tracks Nut down to a gay bar, where he's told that Nut is now allegedly going by Nat. And I just want to say, I called where this was going in the first five minutes. I saw that Ty had a girlfriend who was very pointedly introduced, but then vanished from most of the film, and I'm like, it's her. It's totally her. And lo and behold, this journey has given me a sixth sense for picking out the trans killer. After holding a plastic surgeon at gunpoint, Ty does learn that Nut had transitioned, and was in fact his girlfriend Noi the whole time. And this would be a pretty good dark ending, if they had her kill Ty as the final piece in her revenge, so of course they don't do that. They're like, hey, we know that we played actual jump scare music over the photos of Noi's facial feminization, but like, actually this vengeful murder we've created is really good. And to prove this, she is going to commit suicide by boyfriend, because... I guess she's fully sympathetic now, because remember, the only good trans woman is a dead trans woman. In 2010, Victim is released, the first of two adaptations of the book that would eventually become the film The Skin I Live In, so let's kill two birds with one stone. Both films are about the forced feminization of one man, although the exact details as to why are slightly different. In Victim, it's because the man had intentionally killed the doctor's daughter. In The Skin I Live In, it's because the man sort of accidentally sent the doctor's daughter into a mental breakdown that ends in her suicide. Victim is far more of an exploitation film, it takes this plot and goes all in with the grime of the sleaze. Victim is also just objectively the worst film too, just on a technical level. It was not the one directed by a two-time Academy Award winning director. These films are both weird though, because they both frame transition as a punishment. That tracks for horror though, because emasculation is always the worst thing you can do to a man. Not only do these films take away the man's penis, they explicitly give him a vagina. They make him a woman in every physical sense of the term in order to drive home that he is now lesser than he was before. 
Victim focuses less on the sexual aspect of this, but the skin I live in is almost exclusively focused on emasculating for the sake of sexual humiliation. I have complicated feelings on all of these, but I still feel like Surrender Dorothy is the better of this subgenre, probably because it's far more focused on abusive relationship dynamics as opposed to exploiting the concept of sexual reassignment. Ticked Off Trainers with Knives is an homage to rape revenge exploitation films of the 1970s, following a group of trans women and drag queens who are brutalized before they go on a killing spree in retaliation. So I am not against revenge films focused on trans characters, I'm actually honestly surprised they aren't more prominent, but this one focuses so much on the brutalization that even though it's billed as empowerment, it doesn't really feel like it. I'm going to be very generous and give director Israel Luna the benefit of initially having good intentions. And I say initially because while Luna did cast several trans actresses for these roles, he also really showed himself to be a bit of a fucking asshole during the release of this film, including making and releasing a short film about how GLAAD is run by money-hungry yuppies who don't actually queer care about queer people because they didn't like his movie, because they criticized him, rightfully I might add, for conflating drag queens and trans women, and for making reference to real murders of gay and trans people in the original trailer. I don't know what references means there exactly, whether that means verbal reference or visual illusion, but either way, really fucking bad taste. Obviously, don't judge a film if you haven't seen it, I agree with that sentiment, but Glad was not wrong to take issue with what they did. This is the one film that might bring my earlier assertion about Bit and its status as the first feature horror film to feature a trans protagonist into question. Ultimately, though, I stand by it. First, Ticked Off Trannies conflates dragness. Dragness. First, Ticked Off Trannies conflates drag with transness. And while the two can and do coexist, they are not inherently the same thing. And I am not comfortable guessing the quote unquote real genders of these characters. And secondly, it doesn't feel like this film has a definitive protagonist. On paper, it's Bubbles, but this is far more of an ensemble film that doesn't really give her any specific attention of her own. This is also the point in the list where I realized just how many instances of representation came from low-budget exploitation counterculture filmmakers, which I suppose makes sense if you sit down and think about it. Their bread and butter is doing weird stuff. They like focusing on things that you wouldn't see in a mainstream film, and gender nonconformity more than fits into that category. But where I find exploitation filmmakers going wrong, for lack of a better term, is they take this representation as a chance to do genital horror stories and nothing else. They love exploiting the shock of a transsexual body, and they don't really see it as a chance to make actual characters. This, Gutterballs, and to an extent Terra Firmer, these films only really care about the horror of the violence done onto a body, and care very little about the humanity and identity of the body itself. Transness is kind of inherently counterculture, but I would argue that these films are almost sometimes worse in their transploitation because they're not held to that same standard of mainstream accessibility. Because mainstream films will often allude to this horror and nothing else, but exploitation films will actually show it. And I'm not convinced that that's better, it's just a different form of dehumanization. And this is a problem throughout the exploitation genre, it's not just to do with trans people. But Ticked Off Trannies was the first time where I really sat down and thought about just these decades of missed opportunities within this subgenre. Exploitation is fine, and I do think it's cool that Luna casts so many trans and queer people in his films over and over again, but this one just felt like an unfortunate misfire. The same year as the first Hunger Games, Jennifer Lawrence starred in The House at the End of the Street, a slasher which ends by revealing that the killer had been forced to cross-dress and live as his dead younger sister as a child before eventually snapping and murdering his parents, spending the rest of his life trying to recreate his sister and other women. And finally, in 2013, we have two final films. The first is the sequel to the James Wan hit, Insidious Chapter 2. Pretty easy summation, the ghost of the bride was a character who was born male but forced to live as a female due to having an abusive mother. Copy-paste everything I've already said about the stupid trope. There was no reason for this detail to be added to this character. Then, in the indie scene, we have Truth or Dare, not to be confused with the film of the same name put up by Bloomhouse a few years later. Very simple plot, a group of vloggers gets pulled into a Saw-esque game of Truth or Dare by a superfan, where the ultimate goal is just to survive. I say Saw-esque not just because of the focus on physical torture, but because there is an effort at making this a morality tale. The brother and sister pair are incestuous, one guy's a pedophile, so you think, alright, to atone for their crimes, they've gotta do some horrible shit to each other. But then the crime of our final girl, Jennifer, is like being a rape victim, and then Michelle is guilty of the horrible crime of not telling her boyfriend she's trans, but the movie even fucks that up because they don't have good gore effects, they don't do dares related to these crimes that could serve as justice or something, it's just lame and immature and forgettable.
Okay, so I know we covered an insanely wide berth of films here in this section, but I think what should be taken away from this particular era is how the transsexual killer really cements itself. It's also really the first time that we get a significant number of trans characters who aren't the killers or aren't the antagonists in some way. That being said, they are still framed as other, typically as liars or as deceptive, and who usually still meet a very violent and bloody end. With the obvious exception of the original Psycho, this is really the era that defines trans horror as we know and understand it today. And even outside of horror, this is really the 30-year span that people think of when they think of trans cinema. Transsexuals weren't people yet, even though I will acknowledge that it's debatable whether or not we are now. You could do some really graphic exploitation with us because you could do nudity and gore in a way that you just couldn't before. And the idea of a transsexual is still so new that there's still a shock value to women with penises and men without them. And I still wouldn't say that Hollywood had begun to reckon with this treatment of trans people by the end of this era, and really they still haven't. But I think after this point, there is maybe a bit of guilt. And here we come to our third and final shift. After 2013, I'm torn on whether or not to say films get better. There are certainly still films we're going to discuss in this section that are very bad, but by and large, the films from the last eight years have been markedly different from anything we've seen before. At last, we start to see more trans filmmakers getting behind the camera as well as in front of it, taking control of their own narratives. There's also an explosion of short films that have been coming out, although unfortunately not that many feature-length companions. And that's mostly because, well, for one, it's fucking hard to get a feature made. But two, a lot of the trans filmmakers on this list are young people. They're students, they're just starting out. They're deeply indie. They do not have the resources on their own to be going out and shooting this Color of Night style epic. This section isn't just going to be me hyping up a bunch of trans filmmakers, but like, I'm going to be hyping up a bunch of trans filmmakers and a bunch of really cool filmmakers just in general. So many of these shorts do not really have official releases, so I'm going to be doing my best to point people to where they can view some of these films. Some are on YouTube, some are on Vimeo, and some you just have to send an email or a Twitter DM and ask. I'm really happy to report that with only one exception, every single person that I reached out to for this responded to me very timely, and everybody was incredibly kind. They helped me out so much with putting this together, and I thank each and every one of you, and I hope that I do your films justice. Our first film for this section is 2014's The Samurai. In doing my research, my friend Ten did a podcast episode for Horror Queers about the film, and that entire episode is a very good listen. The plot concerns Jacob, a cop in a small German town. We follow him over the course of one night where he delivers a samurai sword to a mysterious woman, whom he must then attempt to track down and stop from killing everybody in town. This film reminds me a lot of Sleepaway Camp in that it is very messy representation, but I think what it's trying to say outweighs the quote-unquote problematic elements. Because yes, it is a man in a dress story again, but I never got the impression that Kleinhart views trans people as cis crossdressers. Because the samurai is a part of Jacob, whether you want to argue she's a hallucination or not. I think it's rational to view that man in a dress element as how he views himself. Like, I don't know any trans person who hasn't had negative thoughts like that, that we're really just playing dress up as our birth gender. I never got any indication that Kleinhart was attempting to assert that thought as reality. I understood it as intentional casting to get across character motivation and insight. This is another one that I bought, because aside from just being a really solid anti-repression metaphor, it's also just a gorgeous film, probably one of the most well-shot features on this list. My personal taste right now also just really align me with the angrier and messier narratives, so I think that I watched The Samurai at exactly the right time. It's an angry film, it's angry about queer repression, but it also manages to be a sort of escapist fantasy about embracing these angry impulses in a way that we aren't really trained to do. Serial Caller is this British slash from 2014 about a killer going after girls who work for an online sex site. And like, it's weird how we've looked at films that tip the scale into becoming porn, and this one feels way grosser and sticky despite not featuring any porn. Like, it's all clearly shot in some guy's garage, most of the women don't look comfortable being on camera, and I'm half convinced this was made as a secret fetish film. I mean, it's kind of funny to see an attempt at an Argento Giallo style on a $100,000 budget, but it's not funny enough to carry through the whole 90 minutes. But anyway, Stephanie looks like a totally normal woman until they have to reveal her transsexuality, and then she gets crazy exaggerated makeup and bad hair and shit because, you know, I guess a lot of writers really internalize that early Pat Oswalt bit. You realize a clown is just a transvestite that doesn't stop. <laughs> like if you, like if you, 
if you saw a guy in lipstick and eyeshadow, you'd be like, Timmy, leave him alone. That's his own thing. And the guy's like, oh, no, hang on. Whee! Like, oh, Timmy, get a, he's a wonderful clown. Get over there. La Petite Mort 2, Nasty Tapes, is a sequel to a film I have not watched, but I do not think I'm missing out on any real world building either. Nasty Tapes is plotless torture porn, what your mom assumes the Saw films are like. Ryan Nicholson and his wife apparently were responsible for the gore effects, which marks the third time this guy's been talked about on this list, and like with Gutterballs, the film itself is mostly just too dark and visually unappealing for me to even tell if the effects are any good. Mateo is the character who owns this hostile night spot, and he wants to be more like his wife and so he attempts to surgically alter himself. He stitches his wife's breasts onto himself, and eventually we get another graphic castration scene. Again, trying really hard not to speak ill of the recently deceased, but I don't think that most special effects artists get themselves involved in two different movies that involve a trans woman's penis getting violently and graphically destroyed. And the film just ends once Mateo's penis is cut off, so like, was that the point? Everyone at this hostel is murdering people, but Mateo is the really bad one for being trans? We also have two short films released in 2014, but we're actually going to be covering three in this section because this is our first little highlights moment. Louise Weird is a filmmaker from Canada. She writes, direct, directs, directs, edits everything. We've been Twitter mutuals for a bit now, and she was thankfully kind enough to send over some of her directorial work for this list. I am super thankful for that, and you can find all of these films and more on the Vimeo, as well as some on DVD. First, there's Computer Hearts, a 40-minute film about a couple's domestic dispute that escalates once Albert's relationship with an AI starts to get out of hand. I think that this one is probably the most overt trans narrative out of the shorts I watched, and I can't actually show the scene I'm talking about, but you are literally seeing a penis being cut off and fed into a vagina so that Albert's body can be reborn. It's a film about using the internet to fantasize about the perfect girl, whether you want to read that as a romantic partner or an idealized version of yourself. SIDS is next, a six-minute short film that features Ryan Nicholson in a voiceover role, which is a connection I was not expecting to have on this list. Fucking fourth time now he's shown up. But hey, he delivers the phrase son infant death syndrome with such ham that he actually wins some goodwill back after the nightmare and gutter balls. Are you aware of sudden infant death syndrome? And this is also just a really good short film about the fears of like procreation and parenthood, about how something like your own body can quote unquote betray you. As Louise herself points out, it's the story of denial of affirming medical care, about the inability to step inside a male social role and the way a body can reject your efforts to control it. The horror is not the emasculation, but the unnatural pregnancy resulting from maleness. And rounding out Luis's canon is Ambition, a sort of horror music video that was the first thing Luis had made with a proper name in the credits. The music is great, and we're not working with any dialogue here, so the lonely atmosphere and the sense of simultaneous dread and cautious optimism is created entirely through visual language, which Luis is insanely talented in doing. Luis has several other films that she's worked on that I haven't mentioned here, and I cannot recommend enough that you check out the website that she runs with her partner, Diane Copeland. Copeland. They are both exceptionally talented filmmakers, and it is an honor to cover them here. Fiona Dorf is on this list twice, but first we have Blood is Blood. Here she plays Brie, one of four siblings who are all nearly some shade of crazy. The film doesn't so much reveal twists as it does just... show them. Like, there's no surprise about the brother dressing up as a girl. It's shown in the opening few minutes and then again later without any sort of fanfare. Like, yeah, Fiona Dorf's off being crazy. Daniel puts on a dress and make it before he murders girls. This is all just a normal Friday night for them. Why does Daniel dress like a girl before doing these murders? Is Daniel trans or just completely mentally gone? In which case, why does he express this through cross-dressing? Why does his family just go around murdering girls in the first place? Why is Jess the only sibling not aware that her brothers and sister are murdering people? Why does this movie exist at all? All of these questions and more will not be explained by the film in any way, shape, or form. Thankfully, in 2017, Cult of Chucky brings Fernandorf back into good movies. The so far last cinematic installment of the Child's Play main timeline, this film follows Fiona's character Nika after she is institutionalized for the events of the previous film. Chucky's still after her, and carnage ensues. Unlike Seed, there aren't any gender nonconforming dolls in this. Cult earns a spot on the list by portraying something that none of the other Child's Play films have up until this point. Chucky attempting to get into the body of a woman and succeeding at that. Yes, he does attempt this in the prior installment, Curse of Chucky, and he does technically succeed, but that's all off screen, and it's otherwise such an afterthought in the actual movie that it would have felt like cheating to include it. This is the first and so far only time we've seen Chucky successfully transfer a soul into someone, and the gender dynamics are immediately brought into the forefront. So this is different. I don't know. Worse for me. 
This is also something that has been continued for the TV show, so if you haven't already, for the love of God, watch the Chucky series. The Little Girl Who Was Too Fond of Matches is a French-Canadian adaptation of a novel by the same name, and marks the second time I'm going to have to flash the warning all of the triggers graphic. Mostly just for incest, but like, it gets... gross. Not as graphic as Strange Circus, but it made me just as uncomfortable. The story here follows Alice, born a girl but raised as a boy by a nutjob father, before he kills himself and leaves Alice and their brother at the mercy of the townspeople, who are just as confused about what the fuck is happening as we are. They use trans male aesthetics without ever making the character themselves explicitly trans, and akin to something like Sleepaway Camp, we only really get a brief glimpse into what Alice thinks of their own gender, and I don't think that there's a definitive answer for that for most of the film. The intended reading is likely that of Alice being a girl whose gender is forcibly trans, but like, I don't know, let Alice be a pregnant trans man who gives a shit. And like, I know this is based on a novel I haven't read or whatever, but I don't know why Alice is raised as a boy when like, it doesn't matter. No one ever thinks that they're a boy, except I guess that they needed a reason for the character to be ignorant about gender and sexuality. Our first film for 2018 is a vampire action horror by the name of Corbin Nash. This is one of those films where either the casting director knew some people or they cashed in some favors because there's a surprising amount of recognizable names among the nobodies. Malcolm McDowell, Rutger Hauer, and, of course, Corey Feldman as our trans vampire queenie. The plot's, like, inconsequential. Like, it's kind of bad where you can tell they couldn't get certain actors together on set at the same time, so scenes will be edited in such a way to make you think really hard that these two are totally in the same room together. And like the plot, Queenie being trans and being played by Corey Feldman is inconsequential, and just serves to make you sad about the life of Corey Feldman again. Fun fact, and this doesn't have anything to do with the piece, I just think that it's really funny. Uh, if you go to the film's IMDb page, all of the trivia bits are like, obviously planted praise for Corey Feldman. Like, I don't know if Corey did this or one of the directors, but like... It's fucking insane. <laughs> Writer-director Brian Metcalf has been quoted as saying, Corey Feldman is a national treasure, the Brando of the 21st century. Corey Feldman's interpretation of Queenie is considered by many to be the greatest transgender vampire in the history of film, so much so that AFI has requested the original film role for preservation. Like, okay, first of all, no they didn't. And even being the best by virtue of being the only one, like, bit came out the next year. It's funny because without these planted bits of trivia, I might have just kept this film off the list because it veers so much further into dragness than it does at transsexuality. It's it's embarrassing. Switch is a French short film about a teenager who finds that they can aptly switch between male and female forms. It's a film that deals in binaries, not necessarily in support of them, but mostly just acknowledges that regardless of what your gender is, society will define you according to a binary system. You're either one thing or you're the opposite and this film supposes what it's like to live as both, neither, or something else entirely. One user review for this describes it simply as the dysphoria of feeling isolated and alone, and the euphoric bliss of discovering you aren't alone. And that sums it up pretty nicely. It's capital F French, so adjust your expectations accordingly, but I enjoyed this one. Bathroom Troll is a short I feel the need to put asterisks beside. It's been a few decades since we had one of these in earnest, but finally we have some more representation by proxy. Writer-director Aaron Immediato has stated that he didn't want to write a transgender story because he wasn't confident with his ability to do so, which, all right, I'm not going to rag on the guy for that. His intentions were good. He made a response to the anti-trans bathroom bills that were really prominent in 2016 and 2017, and this short focuses on how anti-trans legislation hurts everybody, not just trans people. My gripe is that I'm not confident in my ability to write trans people feels like kind of a lame excuse. Like, write your script and then just have it be read by trans people, or even just basic sensitivity readers. There is or was plans for this to be made into a feature film, so I hope that if that's still going forward, Aaron does make the protagonist explicitly trans this time around, because as it stands, Bathroom Troll is pointed in the right direction, but it doesn't really amount to something memorable. Assassination Nation is... not a film I have great words for. It's about a hacker who sends a small town into chaos when they start leaking details from everyone's private lives, focused specifically on 14 girls at the center of it. And, I don't know, it's one of those movies where every time one of these girls talked, grown 35-year-old man Sam Levinson's face flashed across my vision. Harry Neff does a fine job as Bex, I really like her actually. A trans teen whose storyline is briefly focused on navigating sexuality as a trans person, before all of that gets thrown out the window and we get to see her fucking nearly lynched. Because she's trans, of course she has to get nearly murdered in a hate crime. Someone pointed out that it's nice that the lynch mob made sure to correctly gender her the whole time they were attempting to murder her for being trans, which, yeah, that's a good point actually, and <laughs> I think it's indicative of the film's larger problem where I don't think it really knows what it's talking about. 
the politics are just all over the place. Nobody's sympathetic, and that's the point. And I just hate movies where apathy is the point. Boarding School is set in the nebulous time of the 90s, where Jacob, a tween whose masculinity is constantly being challenged by those around him, is sent to a boarding school, which is run by an abusive religious weirdo with a sinister secondary agenda. Emasculation is a pretty constant theme in this one. It's never outright said that Jacob is trans, but the imagery they invoke is pretty hard to interpret any other way. They tiptoe around it by heavily implying that he is semi-possessed by his grandmother, and the feminine behaviors are actually the result of that, but even that just feels like a lazy, tacked-on excuse. There's also a boy, Phil, who is played by a female actress, but they never do anything with that for me to count that character as trans. It's just really odd casting. Beyond that, it's a pretty standard evil school horror film, complete with some really poor taste depictions of mental disabilities and scenes that honestly made me sort of nauseous with what these child actors were having to say and do. It wasn't actively bad, which is more than I can say for a lot of these films, but it was not actively good either. Knifeheart is a French giallo which focuses on a series of mysterious murders that all connect back to a queer porno studio. Again, I've yet to find a giallo that I really love, but this was pretty serviceable for what it was. Certainly the coolest murder weapon, which I'm going to err on the side of caution on and not show you, so go watch the movie to see what I'm talking about. Just a heads up though, a lot of sexual violence in this one, including a scene of sexual assault that sort of comes out of nowhere, so apply caution appropriately. By way of the trans characters, first we have Misa, a recently transitioned girl who used to work at the studio. She's part of a group of call girls who, I think, are also supposed to be trans girls. Misa and Patau are, as far as I could research, played by cis male actors, while Dominique and Farida are played by trans women, so it's a solid 50-50 split. They come back once or twice, and then Misa dies, and we don't really see the other girls again after that. There's also a part of the film that sort of steals from a blade in the dark, although I admit I don't know if that was intentional or not. It does harken back to that same concept of emasculation and dancing on the line of transness. Still, though, it's always nice to see a film that centers and celebrates queerness and doesn't just feature it as a one-time weird little side quest. I didn't love it, but I have been dying for more queer slashers, and this is a pretty solid B-minus execution of that concept. Lastly, there is Incident in a Ghostland by Martyrs director Pascal Laguerre. In this, a mother and her two daughters are randomly assaulted by random intruders, one of whom is known only as the Candy Truck Woman. Based on the character name and the fact that she's played by a male actor, I would assume that she's meant to be a trans woman, although some people assume the character to be male and in drag. Irregardless of creator intent, though, we technically escape the transsexual killer trope through this lack of specificity, even though this is still a character where our fear of her is telegraphed by putting a male actor into makeup and female dress. Mental instability as signified by overt gender transgressions. I read a review on The Village Voice that called this one a subversion on misogynistic horror films, and that made me go back and re-examine the film through that lens. And I think that's certainly an argument that you could make. The choice to make the villains a caricature of a trans woman and a leather face like disabled man could be read as a reference to older exploitation films, but I'll talk about this in a moment with another film. It's not subversion to uncritically present outdated tropes. Is it an homage? Maybe, sure. But to me, calling it subversion seems like grasping at straws to defend a film that just isn't that good to begin with. Because what is subversive about an unironic portrayal of the scary other? For 2019 first, we're going to France. Terror Sisters is a 30-minute short film about four trans women who imagine the various ways they can get revenge on cis society. The best part of this film is when we focus on the lead girl Kathleen, since her revenge segment is about literally reclaiming a place for herself in a film from a cisgender actor. It's about demanding more and better from what we are expected to be thankful for having, when what we have is often exploitative and not understanding or sympathetic to our human reality. This one also really stretches the definition of horror, but I think the fact that it's only streaming on Shutter gets it in on its own technicality, if nothing else. The entity comes from the Philippines, a haunted house demon possession scary ghost story about a male twin, Louis, returning home after the death of his sister as he attempts to figure out what happened to her. This film is funny because they reveal Louis as transgender after 80 minutes of film has already gone by, and by this point we've already seen him get a period and bind with ace bandages. And like, they justify him being surprised by the twist by saying that he erased his girl self from his mind as a method of survival, but like, uh, I don't have enough time to go into all the reality breaking that this twist introduces. Like, Lewis can't be surprised that he's not biologically male, but also know that he has to hide his breasts and his menstrual cycle to pass his male. Those two things can't coexist, especially when the film admits the parents were obviously well aware of their child's transness, and there's no reason for this to be a secret. The film itself isn't so much about transness as it is the patriarchy in the Philippines, which I am not equipped to discuss, and that's a fine subject to tackle. I just 
I question the characterization of what should be on paper a trans male as a woman who only became male to protect herself from abuse and he goes back to being a woman the moment she realizes she isn't biologically male. That just kind of makes the little needle on my turf meter act up and it's why that while this is technically trans masculine representation, I throw a huge asterisk next to that descriptor. I still consider Strange Circus to be the last feature length horror film that genuinely has a trans male character in it. Now from the UK, Tales from the Lodge is a horror comedy partially in the anthology style. We follow a group of friends as they reunite to celebrate the memory of their friend Jonesy, who killed himself three years earlier. Among the cast is Paul and his new girlfriend Mickey, who is so overtly and stereotypically feminine that I honestly think you can guess what her character reveal is going to be long before they get around to it. The twist of the film is that Mickey is actually Jonesy, who had faked his suicide and transitioned so that he might finally be able to sleep with Paul. This is one of those where it honestly shouldn't have been as offensive as it was, but it's a problem that I have with a lot of recent UK horror and recent horror in general, is the smug acknowledgement of stereotypes while lazily fulfilling them anyway. There are several times where the film comes to a total stop for the characters to comment about the trans killer trope. But seeing as I've been reduced to an outdated horror movie cliche, I think I'm just gonna have to kill everyone. Yeah, look what he did to himself just to have sex with Paul. <laughs> we still need to have a conversation about that, by the way. Why couldn't she have told us we'd have been accepting? Yeah, yeah, we could, but I mean- She murdered Lou, though. That dilutes my sympathy. But it's not subverting the trope just to do the trope. And I think that if they had just gone full exploitation and just let Mickey be a trans woman entirely outside of Jonesy's unrequited lust for Paul, I might have actually really enjoyed this. Because movies about unleashing trans rage are great, and we need more of them, but this is just more assertion that trans people are actually just super dedicated cis rapists in disguise, no matter how badly the script insists that's not what it's saying. Mesmeralda is a 20-minute short film out of New York City, directed by Josh Mateo and starring several trans actors from the area, and... Finally, we're talking about good films again. This is sort of a plotless film, but unlike other examples, this actually works greatly to the film's benefit. There's no dialogue, there's just very striking and vibrant imagery, and it's not like the metaphor is buried deep under a bunch of meaningless artsy bullshit either. It's set in New York, and it plays a lot of 9-11 footage, which I cannot show you, and the conflation is that New York's inability to heal from 9-11 is similar to that of the trans community's inability to heal from its constant brutalization. Both are wounds that aren't being allowed to heal, wounds that keep being ripped open and resulting in further trauma. It's a hauntingly beautiful film, and I'm almost genuinely offended that it's not more well-known than it is. It's really poignant, focusing on this intentional exposure to pain and hurt to the point where you are unable to untangle from your own individual identity. Because at what point does pain become your identity when you're subjected to it so frequently? How does the broader community grow and evolve when it's constantly under physical and emotional attack from all fronts? But even then, the film is not just this exercise in total misery. It's not tragedy porn for tragedy's sake. It's about violence and painful emotion, sure, but at its heart, it is an uplifting film. Wounds can heal, it's just a matter of when. It's about breaking out of that cycle of pain and victimization. Not in a just stop being the victim way, more like, yes, any day could be your last, so don't be afraid to fight for your life on your terms. You can push through more than you think you can. Violence is experienced by the trans community every day, and they are constantly being silenced, says Mateo. I wanted to give something back to the community that has a haunting resonance. So unfortunately, because it uses so much footage from 9-11, this film keeps getting flagged for glorifying terrorism and taken down, which I think is super funny. Like, you can watch Sleepaway Camp uncensored on YouTube, but God forbid a director uses news footage to make a fucking artistic point. But you can request a link to the film from Matteo either on Facebook or on Instagram, and I highly recommend that you do. He is an awesome guy and incredibly friendly. It's a beautiful film, and it's an intelligent film, and it's one of the best ones that I've come across in making this list. Now, again, this isn't a ranked list. But if it were, Bit is undeniably top 5 material. I figured it'd be funny if I just started this section with my Bit shirt on and I didn't explain it until now. And my bit poster. <laughs> These didn't come from any official release, by the way. I had the main for my own use because I really do love this movie and I want people to know about this movie because it deserves more acclaim and even just basic recognition that it's gotten. Like for me, what sucks about Bit hmm, is how quietly it was released. It was put on Tubi in April of 2020 and only recently saw a streaming release on Prime Video. And the only DVD release has been in the UK, which apparently nobody told the cast or crew about. Solid. And look, I get it. Marketing this story was always going to be difficult. When I first pulled up the film's IMDb page and I read Feminist Vampires, my first thought was, 
this is probably going to be awful. And don't get me wrong, this is a low budget film from start to finish. If you're not familiar with or partial to B movies, especially more modern B movies, it's probably going to take you a while to settle into the world that Elmore has created here. It is a film that is far from perfect. But honestly, regardless of polish or whatever other qualifier you want to signify this with, I have maintained that the importance of bit comes from understanding its place in cinematic history. We're politically, socially, and mythologically fucked. Our roles are secondary. Our bodies suspect, alien, other. We're made to be monstrous, so let's be monsters. You now have all gone on this journey with me. For nearly a century, the transgender character in horror has constantly been hobbled by this lack of autonomy. We are killers and we cannot help it because we are so mentally ill or because mommy just didn't want a son. Forget about choice. You are forcibly molded and pressed into this knife-wielding psychopath with enough pressure and force to make diamonds. So what Elmore is rightfully saying here is a basic statement of autonomy. And that is so insanely radical in the face of all we have seen. Society treats us as monsters inherently, and we may choose to be that, but we are not destined to be that. Again, in case the trifecta of bit merchandise didn't clue you in, I love this movie. Even beyond its, its historical importance, it's just a really fun power fantasy that puts trans people into a position of power without ever making us tyrannical or oppressive or forcing us to go down a peg. It's one of those films that I hype up and push onto friends at every chance I get. And although my friends who have seen it all have criticisms, I don't know anyone who hates it or even really dislikes it. So ignore the way that it's been kind of review bombed and please check it out because it is one of the few feature films that I feel confident saying not only is this good, but it understands the history that it is invoking and dealing with. It understands the history of trans horror in a way that I have rarely seen from other filmmakers up until this point. And genuinely, I want to thank Brad Michael Elmore for that because he did his research and it shows in this final project. I know there are some criticisms about how the word transgender is never used in the film and I think I might have had that same criticism at some point but like honestly that's such a nitpick. This movie is made for people who know it's about transness who are seeking this kind of film out for that thing. This isn't fear of the t-word like we've seen before. If Brian Michael Elmore wanted to use transgender he would have and I would rather criticisms of this film be like story choice and aesthetic and not oh he's not representing the community enough like i <laughs> so many problems with that ideology but also like the subdued element of laurel's transness is why i like this movie so much again look back at all we have covered how many trans characters have definitive personalities outside of their transness how many are allowed to have struggles outside of that transness brad michael elmore acknowledges transness but does not define by it which is an exceedingly rare element in many of these films, and I think that Bit sets a very solid bar of expectations for any films to come after. And Hollywood hasn't gotten there just yet, but this does feel like the first step towards something. This film feels like an important first break away from the stories that trans women are typically expected to be included in. And now we're going to get into some short films that were released in 2020 before we get into some features, because these last two years have really been where the era of the transgender indie short kicks off. The first one is Meta, a transmasculine mix of Carrie and Gender Snaps that follows a transgender soon-to-be prom king, Artie, who starts to transform after getting his period at the prom. Out of the two Carrie light shorts that we've had, I think this one's my favorite, just by virtue of it feels like it knows what it's talking about. Unlike Bathroom Troll, we actually do have a trans lead, and the script as well also feels like it understands the topic it's tackling. Body dysphoria, as depicted by Werewolf, is a pretty fun visual in and of itself, and the ending is actually very pleasant and affirming as well. I attempted to reach out to the filmmakers to find out if there are any plans for a wider release after its festival run, but unfortunately I hadn't heard back by the time of filming this, so all I can say is keep your eyes open, set up a Google alert, and hopefully this gets dropped online somewhere soon. First Date is a four-minute short film by Meredith Alloway, part of Hulu's bite-sized Halloween anthology. Four minutes is not enough time for me to really get a feel for these characters, nor is it enough time to really see either actors flex their talent. That being said, it is really good to see Harry Neff again, and in something that I didn't outright hate. And from the second season of the same series, we'll also put the new nanny here. This one's about a witch who straight up murders a child for being mean to a non-binary kid wearing a dress. It's worse than First Date, but also kind of funnier and more memorable, despite its weaker writing. Clocking in at two minutes long, Coming Out is a short film about Godzilla and her child who comes out as transgender. It's one of the best films on this list, it's free on YouTube, and you should go watch it immediately. 
Sweep Away Hungry Ghosts comes from two filmmakers in the UK, Lyndon Fang and Hannah Palumbo. The short concerns a young Asian man struggling to come to terms with the parents' transsexuality after they have died and come back as a sort of ghost. This one has the needle a little firmly on questionable, more so than some of the other shorts, but it's certainly not bad. It's on Vimeo and it's jaw-droppingly gorgeous, should you decide to check it out. And I know I'm going through all of these a little fast, but there's like 20 total minutes of content in all these films combined. And I want people to go and support these films, support these filmmakers, and not just listen to me ramble on about them. So I'm not going to completely cover them here. If you're interested, please seek them out. Our last short brought Craigie's Innocent Boy, an 11 minute short that is the third and last time we will see a black trans character on this list. Yeah, this list is also oddly reflective of how racially monolithic horror still is. It's mostly white folks with a few notable Asian and Hispanic characters and black people barely have a foot in the door. Unique Jenkins does fine with what they're given, but considering they're billed as the protagonist and that's their face on the poster, Penny hardly matters. He screams and rolls around like everyone else, but I don't really know what the point of the character was. Maybe I'm just extra critical because I can really see the cool feature film in this idea and the visual style is amazing, but for the capital F first black protagonist in horror, I'm disappointed that I didn't love this. Like, I love the behind the scenes production and the efforts being made by Mattelli Pictures, the trans and queer and production company behind the short, but the film itself just didn't do anything for me. I also have comments about casting a non-binary actor to play a binary trans role, but there's a different film I'll go into more detail with that in regards to, so put a pin in that point. Next are the feature films of 2020, starting with The Deep Ones. This is another film where I feel like my views on the director have massively impacted how I view the film. <laughs> like, you're either really fucking stupid or really secure in your position as a director to give an interview where you're like, oh, it's so sad how this director with credible abuse allegations can't make his next movie. No matter how awful the person is, a racist or whatever, you still have to look and weigh in on his or her accomplishments. Like, no, Chad, you really don't. Uh, anyway, The Deep Ones is our first film since Corbin Nash to feature a man in a wig. Great. Yeah, that's Chad's accomplishment that I have to weigh in on. The story is based on a Lovecraft story, The Shadow Over Innsmouth, but besides the title and some vague Lovecraftian hallmarks, the film is an entirely original Rosemary's Baby ripoff. Chad Farron has said that the doctor, Jean Rayburn, was not originally written as a trans woman, and that I actually do believe. Mostly because this feels like the kind of script where if something like that was intentionally written in, he would have drawn attention to it. Gene is no weirder than any other character on display, and so we're sort of just left with the question of why. Why maintain a transphobic caricature when nothing about the story invokes it, and when you don't even attempt to exploit it either? Because Chad Farron sounds like he sucks, to be perfectly blunt. We get worse before we get better. 32 Malanzana Street comes from Spain as a shorter original movie, and... Oh boy. The film is very heavily inspired by James Wan films like Insidious and the Conjuring, focused mainly on a haunted apartment and the terrorized family inside. It's already a very questionable film for its depictions of Lola, a disabled girl. Even beyond casting an able-bodied actress, the script is just... so dehumanizing. Weird. Like, there's a line about how she can communicate with spirits because her mind doesn't have any boundaries, and I think it's supposed to be, like, a compliment about how she's different and special compared to everyone else, but... oh, it does not come across like it. And... That is all before we get to the transgender ghost. The oldest daughter of the haunted family is a girl named Impero, who eventually manages to seek out the woman who previously lived in the apartment alongside her deceased sister, who was the one haunting them. It's here that we reveal the ghost Clara was a trans woman, severely abused by her parents and eventually her sister as well. And to her credit, Impero pretty immediately goes, wow, that's fucked up, and goes back and tries to satiate Clara. But the film decides that no, you aren't supposed to sympathize with Clara. She's fully evil because she can't accept her inability to get pregnant, and then the only death of the film is Lola because this is a cruel fucking movie that feels like an attempt to justify somebody's prejudices against trans women. This is far from the first depiction of a trans woman as evil because of her desire to have children, but it's definitely one of the most spiteful by way of denying her even one moment of humanization. Freaky is mostly subtextual representation by way of a body swap plot, but I think that writers Mike Kennedy and Chris Landon draw enough parallels between the body swap and genuine dysphoria to qualify the film. Main character Millie is put into a male body for the majority of the film, where she openly admits that she's enjoyed the male body over the body she was born into. The narrative is ultimately about her accepting her female body as being just as strong as her male one, but still, there's lots of fun to be had in an entire film about feeling out of place in your body and how social perception works. Plus, best friends Nyla and Josh, despite not being non-binary characters, are both played by non-binary actors, Celeste O'Connor and Michelle Sharovich, who have both been very vocal about their identities and who both seem like incredibly cool people. 
The Craft Legacy is the long-awaited, somewhat long-dreaded sequel to the original cult film The Craft. It is a lot like the Evil Dead reboot in that it doesn't decanonize the original and actually has a lot to do with continuing that story, but it's a bunch of new characters reenacting a lot of the story's original beats. It's a guilty pleasure sort of movie for me because I don't think it's like technically a good movie, but I really enjoyed the characters, enough to where I can kind of forgive the meandering, ill-conceived plot. One of our teen witches is Lourdes, played by a trans actress Zoe Luna, who seems like an absolute delight. Unfortunately though, Lourdes and other witch Tabby are pretty undefined background characters, with most of the film's focus going to main character Lily and, unfortunate, comic relief. There's one or two lines about trans women thrown in there, not in a way that feels apathetic or anything, but it's clearly something they felt like, we kind of have to throw this in there, even if we're not totally confident in our ability to do so, so let's just kind of keep it low-key. Yeah, it's all good. Y'all know trans girls got our own magic anyway. <laughs> Honestly, I wish the film had done better, so we could have gotten a third film, maybe, with more of a focus on these characters. No, I don't. Women with an X. <laughs> Laxmi is actually a remake of Muni 2 Kanchana, both directed by Raghava Lawrence. The plot here concerns a Hijara woman who was murdered for her land, and who subsequently possesses a man in order to get revenge on her murderers. This is a weird film to discuss, not the least of which being that I am not knowledgeable on Indian politics, and so I just don't feel quite comfortable hitting on some of the critiques of the film that I've read. There are several other trans characters in the film besides our main one, the titular Laxmi, and ultimately the goal of the film does seem to be uplifting their voices and the issues they face, from my ignorant Western point of view, I did cringe a lot, and I have read criticisms of the film from actual Hijara people. That being said, Raghava Lawrence did donate a lot of money towards housing for Hijara people, so I don't necessarily buy into the idea that he's an exploitative monster either. I'm gonna say good intentions, questionable at best execution. Finally, for this recent 2021, there are three feature films to talk about and six shorts. Love You Forever is a short film by sisters Sefer and Sepin Masioff, Hoping to fucking god that I pronounced that right. Filmed in 2019 and getting a tour of festivals into the 2020s. In the process of making this, I realized that apparently I do not keep very good track of who I'm following on Twitter because it turns out that Sepin and I have been following each other this entire time. Great. She was kind enough to send me this debut film, a 20 minute short just bursting at the seams with ideas and love and hate and it is beautiful. It's a judgment-free examination of the relationship between two sisters, though it does focus more on Sepin and her complicated emotions about their codependency. Love and envy are presented not as contrasting, but as complementary emotions that enhance one another. I usually hate calling films Lynchian because, like, that term has always felt like a very cheap way to describe anything mildly non-structured and weird. Like, oh yeah, this film's totally Lynchian and it does a bunch of time jumps, so wacky and quirky. But I think that Love You Forever actually does earn that descriptor. It's very episodic. It veers in between feeling very dreamlike and feeling like a nightmare, as indicated by the presence of red neons. And considering that this is the sister's first film, it is insanely well made, and it's really well edited too. Especially considering that, for me, the editing is always usually the weakest points of indie films, and short films in particular. This one is currently still drifting around film festivals, although I do not doubt that it will find a more permanent home after that, and I highly, highly Highly encourage that you check it out at that point. There's also Monster Day, a four minute short film about a clay sculpture that comes to life. And I would hesitate to call this porn <laughs> because that feels unintentionally dismissive. It's a fun little sexual fantasy. If we are, as Bit says, made to be monsters, it stands to reason that we should have sex with monsters. It's pretty surface level at first glance, but I feel like if you're trans, you're going to latch onto some of the more subtextual stuff that may or may not have been in intentional on part of the filmmakers. There is more to this than just softcore pornography. Still, I would not recommend that you watch this with your parents. I would love to tell you all about what happens in Brain Death, but I can honestly say that this was the only film on this list where I just completely didn't get it. I know there's this pig man, I know there's this right-wing wrestling talk show radio host, I know there's a trans woman Liv, played by Hesse Denny, and that's the extent of all I know for certain. <laughs> I can only find one interview with the director, and that sort of helped, but there's only a very loose story here, intentionally so. There are elements of a commentary about right-wing ideology as this inherent evil, and our relationship with technology and the internet, but I don't exactly know what they all have to do with each other in the context of the film. I didn't dislike this film, by the way, but I struggled to describe who I think would like it. 
honestly, the stuff I liked best happened early on where Hesteni has these long conversations with her fictional girlfriend because it just felt like I was listening to real conversations and it was really touching, especially when she recounts how she and her girlfriend first met. That stuff was pretty genuinely romantic. But this is another uncertain film in terms of its future distribution rights. According to that aforementioned interview with the director, there might be plans for more festivals, there might be plans to do a limited VHS release, but it doesn't really sound like anything yet is certain. Lake Forest Road is an eight minute short film about a mysterious entity in the woods, and I'm not gonna lie, I'm kinda cheating to include this one. The character of Kyle is not explicitly trans, nor does transness matter at all to the plot, but Kyle is played by a trans actor, and I wanted to include something that featured a trans male actor because of how fucking rare that is in horror. It's a perfectly serviceable short film, it's fine, watch it for JJ Hawkins. AI Mama is a short film by Los Angeles filmmaker Asuka Lin, and while I feel like a comparison to Tetsuo the Iron Man might be obvious, I also feel like it's appropriate. It's shot in black and white, it concerns stop-motion body horror, and it's about the relationship between identities and binary systems. For a low-budget affair, I am legitimately so blown away by the technical artistry on display here. Lin and their crew clearly put an insane amount of work into this film, and it shows in every single second. I also think that their gender identity coincided with the film's desire to break different types of binaries, such as machine-human, mother-child, creation-creator, man-woman. I think all these divisions actually overlap and merge in a multi-layered way. It's never one or the other. AI Mama was my way of expressing my frustrations with these restrictive labels, and gender was one of those factors. Lynn's another filmmaker that I am lucky enough to be following on Twitter now, although that happened after I wrote my initial piece on the film, so you can't accuse me of bias on this one. Go to their website, AI Mama will be up there shortly if it has not been uploaded already by the time this video comes out, and all their other shorts. Please go support this amazing talent. Last for the shorts is Queerant, and there is just very minimal information about this film that I could find anywhere online which is really frustrating because it is a good film about a non-binary person who has to come to terms with their dysphoria inside this weird little therapy house. V.R.I. Bell does a great job, and their internal monologue being represented by these two warring binary voices I thought was a really good and poignant way to represent what dysphoria feels like to some people. At the moment, the film is bouncing from film festival to film festival, but if you are curious about where this film currently is screening and where it may eventually end up in a more permanent state, I highly recommend that you follow the film's director on their Instagram or their Twitter page for more updates as they come out. For our first 2021 feature, there is the Netflix adaptation of the novel of the same name, There's Someone Inside Your House. <sighs> okay, so we're going to do a tally at the end of this, but if you've been paying attention, you might have noticed that there is not a whole lot of transgender men in horror. There's a few, but statistically you are far more likely to get someone who's a trans woman or whose gender is not exactly definable. So when I heard about this movie, and I heard about Darby, this explicitly trans character who also happened to be a male, I actually let myself get a little bit excited. You know, sure, he's a very minor side character, and he's not well described in the novel, but this is a feature film, a major Netflix release at that. This has the potential to be really huge. And about two weeks before the film's released, the full cast was finally put on IMDb and this was the actor they had for Darby. And a few days later, my friend who got a screener sent me a message, and I'm not saying their name in case this is something that they can get in trouble for retroactively, <laughs> but they told me that the character had been changed from trans male to non-binary. And I have to be very careful <laughs> in how I word this, and I'm going to try to be brief because I have already written about this semi in length, so you can go check that out if you want what is mostly my personal thoughts about this change without going so much into the film itself. In short, I feel like Netflix was probably trying to follow the trend of making their cast as inclusive as possible, and they looked at this transsexual male and not woke enough, too much trouble to find a young male actor, cis people view binary trans people as scary, and non-binary is a more palatable transness to cis society. I don't know, and maybe they didn't think about it this hard, but that in and of itself is also a problem. <laughs> this was honestly one of the least offensive films I watched in the course of making this list, but that small change of changing Darby from binary transsexual to non-binary still just like, it, it broke me for several days. And especially with what we saw Netflix do in the aftermath of the most recent Dave Chappelle special and how they treated their transgender employees, it's not like that company's overt transphobia is a secret. 
that's also why I love ragging on Netflix as hard as I do, because I know as a creative, there is not a chance that they're ever going to buy my explicitly transgender horror stories. There's no way. They hate trans people too much. Just like in the novel, Darby's identity doesn't matter to the plot at all except to give a reason to show transphobia. In both stories, Darby gets deadnamed. In the novel, it's really just the narrator providing his backstory, and the author making some capital C choices, but in the film this is conveyed in a monologue that happens to be in front of half the goddamn school, and I don't know how they thought that was better. His name, or her name, depending on the day, is Darby. Born Justine Darby, this student showed me the meaning of courage. When at age 11, she came out to our school as she, he, and they. And now every day in my mind, I applaud her, him, and them. They also give Darby a space obsession, which I'm sure was supposed to make them seem more three-dimensional, but all it does is set them up being called an alien, and it just feels like playing into the weird liberal dehumanization of trans people. Yes, the character who says all this is clearly framed to be in the wrong, but that doesn't make any of this easier to watch and digest. In a review of the film, a friend said that he's convinced that trans characters only exist in these films to experience transphobia, because that's the only time our identities are relevant enough to depict. And he's not wrong. <laughs> a few of these more recent mainstream movies made by cis people, they define these characters by their transness. Of course there's dead naming, of course there's attempted or successful hate crimes, because trans people are still just statistics boxes to these writers. What else does a trans person do ex besides experiencing bigotry? Nothing else about them matters besides their marginalization. That's another major shift, I think, between eras. Because let's say from 1960 until 2013, it was very common to see a trans character because the writer was just simply out of ideas. It's low-hanging fruit, it's an easy way to invoke a reaction out of your audience, and there wasn't a whole lot of thought to representing a community. But recently, people seem to want to represent transness, not trans people. Now, inclusion of transness feels intentional, but to a point. In terms of the mainstream, we're still not yet humanized to the point where we can have our own stories. We're still interchangeable identities with each other. We're still side characters. We're still support beams for the cisgender protagonists. We're not human enough yet to be protagonists ourselves. Because these studios don't want the backlash involved in delivering bad representation, and so they're too focused on playing it safe to actually deliver good representation. They've got the representation of the physical body more or less down, at least compared to how it was a few years ago, but it's a hollow body. It's an empty pinata, there's nothing inside, and I don't really feel like that's any better than the trans killer trope that we're used to getting. Also released in 2021 are two films by Alice McKay, one short and one feature. The first is The Serpent's Nest, a 26 minute short about Sophia, a non-binary teenager portrayed by non-binary actor Jamila Maine. After moving to a new town, Sophia finds themselves drawn into a toxic relationship with Jen, which further results in black magic and murder. I don't have a whole lot to say about this one, it's totally fine. You can tell that it's a film made by a teenager, and I mean that in the nicest way possible. It's very passionate and overflowing with ideas, but there's just not enough time to really flesh them out and make them really impactful. But I'm also aware that I'm hypercritical of short films, so if this looks like something you'd be into, absolutely check it out. It's like a spiritual third of the craft film. There's witches and misandry and magic, and it's a fun light watch. In one interview, Alice cites two Brad Michael Elmore films and her list of favorite horror films, Bit being one of them. And... I'm not gonna lie, I probably would have picked up on that in both of these films, even if I hadn't read that interview. And that's not a bad thing either, that's just me being a total fucking nerd and recognizing similar themes in both of these works. Especially here with our next film. So Van was unleashed upon festivals in late 2021 and follows Kurt, played by drag artist Zai, a wannabe drag performer who was turned into a vampire by the most Australian looking man I have ever seen in my life. His name's Landon, he's great. Kurt is saved from death by April and Harley, and the rest of the film... I feel like the plot doesn't really matter from there. <laughs> like, yeah, they've got to defeat Landon, and there's some tension between Kurt and his best friend Katie, but I think the film's at its best when it shucks the plot entirely, and it just focuses on the group dynamic between all of these queer vampires. This is the film that made me coin the term bitfluence, because while the stories aren't really comparable, I also think the film functions as a very fun response piece to something like Bit, and... I never want it to sound like I think trans horror wouldn't exist in its modern form without Bit. Obviously that's not true, but I do feel like Bit laid the table setting out for something like So Van. Both are films that use vampires as explicit metaphors for queerness, both focus on good and bad vampires, and both are ultimately about finding your own community. I'm like flatly neutral on drag, I don't love it and I don't hate it, so I wasn't 
terribly invested in any of these scenes, but I was mostly really impressed by the amount of enthusiasm on display, both behind the camera and in front of it. I dedicated myself to seeking this film out because of watching Alice's previous works and because Grace Highland was featured pretty prominently in the advertising, but I would say that a surprising majority of the cast is non-binary or non-conforming or trans in some way or another, including our protagonist, Kurt. Harley was probably my favorite character with Andy coming in a very tight second, and all of these kids are either making their acting debut or at the very least their feature film debut, and while that results in not professional level acting, I also don't think that you should be looking for professional level acting in something like this. It's camp at the highest level. It's like watching Rocky Horror Picture Show as put on by all of your best friends in a garage somewhere. It's not polished, but it's fun, and that's far more important to me. It's a fun film, and we need more of those. I also feel the need to point out that Alice is, at the time of this recording, 17 years old, and she has already got four short films and one feature-length film under her belt. She has an insane work ethic, and she is a name that I certainly am going to be keeping tabs on from here on out. And I would seriously recommend checking her out on Instagram. She is still filming queer horror shorts, and she has already evolved so much over the last year alone, and I cannot wait to see where she goes from here. Back in 2008, HorrorYearbook.com published a list of the top 15 transsexual killer movies. That list doesn't cover any films that I haven't also touched upon, but it does have several lines that I think reveals a lot about why the trans killer trope has endured, and why it's only been the last decade that we've really made a push to get away from those depictions. Admittedly, these films are not politically correct, and in some cases they are downright offensive to trans people. But political correctness aside, they do in some cases successfully exploit the uncomfortable feelings most people still have about gender and sexuality. For the lazy writer, the transsexual angle is an easy way to dramatize a killer's dual personality, and to exploit an audience's ingrained prejudices and fears, and to touch upon certain undercurrents of misogyny and homophobia that are uncomfortable, but can also make for disturbing and gripping filmmaking. What better way to dramatize the split mind of a psychopath than to have a killer who can't even reconcile their own gender? That article was removed from the website sometime in 2012 before the website itself eventually went defunct, but ignoring the early 2000s-ness of that quote, I don't think they're entirely wrong. Some films, like Psycho, earn their twist by being genuinely good works of art, regardless of what they're saying about gender. But in most cases, it's hard to shake the feeling that a character's reveal as a transsexual is anything more than low-hanging fruit that a desperate and frustrated screenwriter took a stab at. They want to be Hitchcock, they want to have a memorable film with a long shelf life, let's shock the audience by giving a girl a penis. If you're curious, the breakdown of representation looks something like this. Out of the 108 films discussed here, 85 feature transgender or transfeminine women, 14 feature transgender or transmasculine men, and 11 fall into the absurdly general other category. You can go and subdivide that category into non-binary, intersex, and everything else is undefinable, but that's our main three. Now, is that every trans horror movie? No, of course not. Even by my own count, there's still 30 or so films that I have to track down and watch, and that's not counting films that have yet to come out or that are waiting for me to discover them on some obscure IMDb list from 2007. And some of these films, especially the more recent ones, represent multiple identities, so that number isn't going to come out to an even 108. I split this whole thing into three eras because those were what I felt best summarized the times that we have seen for trans horror. Pre-1980, we see a lot of semi-sympathetic portrayals alongside the psychopath killer thing. It feels like the writers and the audiences were almost trying to understand our reality, while not really being able to talk about it explicitly. Then 1980 hits and things just get ridiculous. If the trans character by some miracle isn't the killer, then they exist exclusively to be a joke and to be brutalized. It isn't until the mid-2010s that we start to see that final shift to become more sympathetic, in no small part due to reclaiming our own narratives. There's less trans killers and more attempts at humanization, although trans killers do still persist in increasingly bad taste depictions. From cis filmmakers, the new trend for depiction has taken the form of a sympathetic background character, but from trans filmmakers, this just looks like, at the bare minimum, seeing ourselves. Boring protagonists, flaw protagonists, messy and human characters that we have been long overdue from. Like, it's still revolutionary just to see ourselves on screen portrayed in a way that isn't inherently tied to misogyny and pedophilia. When I wrote my original piece, I cited a lack of evolution in these films, and I'd like to go back on that a little bit. The evolution of the transsexual in horror is there, but unless you're looking at the whole picture, you're going to struggle to see it. That's why the whole picture is so important. It's why I think that context and intent are oftentimes more important than what the representation actually is. 
I like the samurai more than gutter balls, because even though they both put cis men into these roles, the samurai is sympathetic, and I think that you can feel Kleinart's intentions coming through the less PC elements. We've seen the physical depictions evolve, we've seen attitude towards transsexuality evolve, and we've seen our own opportunities evolve as well. But moving away from some of the more boring rote depictions of like, oh my god, hysteria, it's a man in a dress, or uh, a gender non-conforming villain, like, there's opportunities to look at what internalizing or not recognizing who you truly are, what the damaging effects of society forcing people to do that results in. And I think that that's where, for me, the power of trans horror gets to come out is people being like, I can't fucking do this anymore. And when you try to repress me or deny me who I truly am, there will be violent and bloody consequences. So making this list got really difficult towards the end because I really, really wanted to include everything coming out soon, and that just didn't turn out to be possible. We're all going to the World's Fair is one of my biggest regrets, that I didn't get to see it at Sundance, and it's not being released widely until 2022, and I just could not justify holding up production on this major project for one film. There's also Silas Howard's Moonshadow, which has been in pre-production for three or four years now, but promises to have a transgender teen as its protagonist. There is also A Beast in Love, another feature film that has technically been released in festivals but has not yet had a wide release. Evil Dead Rise has a trans male actor among its cast, which will likely make it the first mainstream horror film to feature a trans male actor prominently. Filmmaker Celine Kabinsky's The Moon is a Hologram may allegedly be coming out in the next year or so, along with Audrey Maynard's Transform. I think besides The World's Fair, the next major horror film that has traction is Whistler Camp, which just recently announced the remain as its lead, and the plot there sounds like basically what it sounds like Moonshadow is going to end up being. But conversion therapy is an easy setting if you're going for a quote-unquote universal fear for LGBT people. I have some preemptive frustrations and concerns with regards to that, but so far they have at least gotten the bare minimum of casting trans people in trans roles correctly, so that's one we're just going to have to wait and see. I think my biggest concern for the future is just getting projects made and getting them seen. Distribution was another major issue in creating this list because a lot of these newer films don't have easy ways to get out there. Some of these filmmakers can upload to YouTube or to Vimeo, but that's not the way that everybody can go. And I talked about this more extensively when I wrote about Someone's Inside Your House, but I'm really hoping that we get more films like Bit and less pandering. We need films where we're the protagonists. We can't just continue to be the quirky best friend or the antagonist without humanity. There needs to be nuance in our portrayals, and for nuance to happen, we need to have characters. So this is the weird part of the script, where I don't really know how to end things. Obviously, even though I want this list to be as comprehensive as possible, this video is going to be dated like the second it publishes. God willing, I will continue to discover more old films, and more new films will continue to come out into the future. And I will continue to catalog these lists. There is the main letterbox list that I am currently curating, and there are my future plans for this project, which will hopefully gain some forward momentum very, very soon, and I hope that all of this work is helping somebody. A filmmaker, a writer, or even just another transgender horror fan who wants to see themselves in the genre that they love. Because that's how this started for me. I just wanted to see what my place was in my own community, and it snowballed into this giant project. Like, while I was writing this, I started getting these emails from students in Australia who were writing about queer horror for school. But to get super specific, one of these emails was from a kid named Kai, who was like 15 or 16, and at the end of their email, they put, I'd also just like to say, it's really nice to see another trans person who's just as interested in horror as me. And, like, I read that, and... Man. <laughs> because, like, that's all I want. <laughs> I want these younger kids to know they have a home in horror, that we have a home in horror, and it's not a great house right now, the pipes are leaking, but like, we have a home here. Horror is for us. On a personal note, this did end up being a really positive undertaking for me, because, I mean, this has been my passion for nearly two years now. And I'm filming this beforehand, but by the time this video goes up, I am going to be recovering from top surgery. And I think that's a good end to this chapter. It's not the end end. Obviously, trans horror is going to continue to evolve, and I have so many future plans for my work in this subgenre. 
But at least for the next few months, I'm going to try and focus on some other stuff first. Reason being, I am a critical writer, I enjoy doing film criticism, and especially with regards to horror and queer film, but I also write fiction. Around the same time that I started this list, I started writing screenplays for the first time because I came to the realization that I didn't just want to sit around and wait for other people to represent me. And out of that has come a nearly complete novel and a fully completed screenplay. And behind that, there are so many more ideas that I am actively working on and trying to get out into the world. And all of these stories have trans main characters. There's gay trans men, there's a trans straight couple, there's non-binary lesbians, there's a trans woman who is a slasher on her own merits and not just because she wanted to fuck some cis guy. There's vampires, there's werewolves, there's body horror, there's all the fun stuff that I love to see in horror. And before I started writing that first script, I hadn't written original fiction since I was a kid. I kind of just assumed that I'd fallen out of love with it, but this just proved to me, no, I just needed to get pointed in the right direction. And obviously, ultimately, I hope to sell these. I hope to get my scripts produced, and I have been lucky enough to have at least been glanced at by one or two indie producers. There is interest in these stories. People want these stories. It's just a matter of getting cis people to invest money into it, which... Yeah, it's a little bit harder to do. But no matter how long it takes, I am dedicated to getting these stories out into the world one way or another. A stable space does not currently exist for me, so I am creating one. As a creative, I have to be the change I want to see, because I want things to be better for the next generation of horror fans. <laughs> There's not a chance that anybody's still watching this far, but in case you are, that is the point that I want you to get out of this. The history of transsexuals and horror is messy and it's problematic, and it's more bad than it is good, but it's a history that you can and should learn from. And it's not all bad. I hope that I have highlighted some films that you haven't heard of that are genuinely really good and fun and heartfelt. Trans people need our voices heard in horror, and we have a ridiculous number of stories to tell. And I know that there are more trans people out there who love horror and have story ideas, who just need to be let into the room to tell them. In her dissertation, Real Gender, Examining the Politics of Trans Images in Film and Media, Joelle Ryan has an entire chapter dedicated to the trans killer trope as it stood in 2009, and she really nails a lot of what I'm also aiming to talk about. Horror films provide a location where viewers can confront that which makes them anxious. In essence, viewers are working out and working through, often subliminally, complex emotional issues through interfacing with cinematic terror. While there is certainly demonization of the trans killer, there is also sympathy, identification, and pleasure with them. It is precisely this ambiguity that makes analyzing the trans killer so complex. They are intensely revelatory moments that shine a light on the way that gender oppression is woven into the very fabric of American society. Further, might the transsexual spectator find a sympathetic identification with the monster image, or discover an ironic sense of empowerment through being so defined? The joy of this list is the good films. And I would say that my sense and my friend's sense of empowerment in many of these figures aren't actually that ironic. My favorite line from Bit is, we're made to be monsters, so let's be monsters. And that's the joy of many of these films. At worst, yes, they're cruel and offensive and ultimately meaningless. But at their best, trans horror films are an embrace of our status as societal monsters. They are celebrations of gender and sexuality and bloodshed. They make a place for us to work out all of our uglier emotions, to see ourselves in positions of power for however brief a time. They are messy, messy love letters to our complicated existence, and in many ways they are the most honest depictions of the pain and the joy that we will experience. Thank you for watching, and have a good night, from one monster to another. Oh, 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 oh,